Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV in association with Jammu Trauma Society to introduce today's program and the speakers. I hand over to the organizing chairman, Dr. Sanjeev Gupta. Oh. Uh, good evening. Uh, yes, Dr. Sanjeev Gupta, you can go on. We are ready. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, I, on behalf of Jammu Trauma Society, welcome all of you to the sixth annual Jammu Trauma Meet, uh, which is a virtual meet for the first time because of the COVID, COVID pandemic. So we have a star-studded faculty today from all across the world. Uh, we will have speakers, uh, namely Dr. Atul Shirvasta from Agra, Mr. Anand Mahapatra from Ireland. Dr. Ramesh Sen from Chandigarh, Dr. Rakesh Rajput from Kolkata, Dr. R.B. Kalia from Ames Rishikesh, Dr. Ashish Gulia from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, Dr. Harpal Seli from DMC Ludhiana, Dr. Altaf Kursa from Bone Joint Hospital, Srinagar, Dr. P.N. Gupta from GMC Chandigarh, Dr. Arthi Diwan from Amritsar, Dr. Mohammad Farooq Bhatt from GMC Jammu, Dr. Bhavu Gurg from Ames, Delhi. Dr. Mani Singh from GMC, Jammu. Dr. Siddharth Sharma from PJ Chandigarh. Dr. Altaf Warid from Pune. Dr. Samarth Mittal from Ames, Delhi. Dr. Rashid Anjum from GMC, Jammu. Dr. Khalid Muzaffar from GMC, Doda. Dr. Mohammad Hasi from London. Dr. Mohammad Azaruddin from Leh. So we have a faculty from all corners of the world. So without taking much time, I will start with the first speaker, who is Dr. Khalid Muzaffar, who will be speaking on our experience with limb reconstruction in non-union stevia. Hand over the mic to Dr. Khalid Muzaffar now. Hi, good evening, everybody. I will start my presentation. I will share screen. Please see whether this is available. Hello. Hello. Yes, go ahead. We can see it. Okay. So, the topic for me today is limb reconstruction, non union tibia, over experience. I am presenting some of our non union tibia cases treated mostly by an external fixator AO oblique LRS or a combined approach, muscular plus LRS frame. Why I am presenting? Because I work in a low resource setup in a remote area. Most of my patients have exhausted their financial resources. Sometimes I am also not sure how to go ahead and I have limited access to help. Aim is to generate a discussion. What best could have been done or if better strategies would help in decreasing the morbidity and improving results. Also point out lacunae in our approach and learn from our mistakes. I also introduce a way of combining classifications which assist me in deciding probable management strategy. Let's start by a case. A young 40-year-old male patient presented with his leg in cast with x-ray picture like this. On opening cast, he had a discharging sign at the distal fracture site. He had been operated three times previously with X fix and a rotational flap initially, then interlocking nail, which had got infected and was ultimately removed. Probably nail had also pierced the distal tibia plafon. So what do you plan for this patient? I hope when you plan for this patient, you have considered infection, bone defect, whether present or absent, deformity, whether it is stiff or non-stiff, comorbidities, and his 
affordability, whether he can afford treatment or not. For him, the treatment is staged. The change in we change it from infective to a non-infective. So we do a debridement, correct deformity, and then try to achieve union or do all these things simultaneously. In first stage, we planned it for acute correction and stabilization by a LRS frame. Debridement and antibiotic cement for distal fracture was done in the same sting. In second stage, bone grafting after the infection subsided. Post-op, it looked like this. The distal pin is very close to the joint. We did it when we did not have a C-arm available in our hospital. Six weeks later, bone cement was removed and bone grafting added to both fracture. Last spin was removed. Union at six months. Final follow-up. This is the knee ROM. There is shortening of around three centimeters. But patient is able to walk. So let's go to theory of non-union first. So when a fracture healing has come to a halt or when fracture has not united beyond stipulated time for that fracture. We all know the FDA definition. Pain on weight bearing or inability to use the limb is the classical sign. So reasons can be money. There can be metabolic reasons, general health condition of the patient or the comorbidities, smoking, other drug intakes like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Local factors that it can be an open injury, there can be a vascularity compromise, or there can be a poor or loose fixation and infection. Of all prognostic factors in tibia fracture care that imply worse prognosis is infection. So how does infection cause non-union? Osteomyelitis leads to thrombosis of blood vessels of haversion system which leads to dead bone formation. There is also infected granulation tissue, which can eat up and cause osteolysis and lead to gap non-union. Moreover, if implant is there, biofilm will form around the implant and then microbes will become resistant to antibiotics. Most important things to rule out the infection are the clinical signs, ESR, CRP, CBC, radiography, your radio, uh, MRI, CT, radionucleotide scans, which are not available to us, cultures. Now, there are many classifications how you can classify these non-unions. We will have a classification which will divide them into infected, non-infected, then no infected would have separate classification, while non-infected has separate classification. We have classification which we classically use are Judith and Miller and Pallet classification. There are also classifications like VLAND classification, Vimirau classification, Rosen et al. and our own GS Kulkarni classification. The Judith and Muller is based on whether there is a hypertrophic or atrophic non-union. Similarly, he has divided it on the anatomical appearance like an elephant foot or soup, oligotrophic or a totally atrophic non-union. VLAND is based on the extent of infection. Type 1 is characterized by exposed bone without bone infection but soft tissue infection. Type 2 has a limited bone infection, while type 3 has a bone defect with a lot of infection. Humirous also has classified it into, depending on the viability of bone ends and presence of whether the limb is short or presence of bone defect. Same way, Pali has classified it into a stiff and non-stiff unions with or without bone loss. And he has classified it uh, like A1, which is a mobile non-union without bone loss or a bone loss of less than one centimeter. If there is more than one centimeter bone loss, he uh, divides it into type B. Rosen et al. again infected. He has said whether it is actively infected or a non-actively infected or a recent infection. GS Kulkarni almost similar classification to Umirao classification. So what I do, I work in a remote area. I have combined all these classifications, which help me in determining the strategy for my cases. I divide, I take these criteria into consideration, whether the patient is infected or it is non-infected, whether it is active infection or recent infection, 
with or without a bone defect with or without a deformity and if the deformity is stiff or non stiff deformity for infection the most important thing is debridement fill the gap either by antibiotic bone cement or some or normal bone cement stabilization by an x fix i am talking about infection so i don't usually do a internal fixation in these cases or it is recommended for deformity if it is a stiff deformity i go for gradual correction if it is a non stiff deformity i go for acute correction for bone defects usually for bone defects up to 2 cm acute docking for bone uh, defects I think the connection is lost probably. <laughs> I think he disconnected. Uh, can we go on to the next presentation? We can come back to him when he comes back. Yes, I am I'm ready with mine. I think I am next. Yeah, okay. Varid, you can uh, continue. All right. So I'll start sharing my screen. Yes. Is it visible? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank at the outset Dr. Abdul Ghani and Jammu Trauma Society for giving me an opportunity to talk about this particular topic. So I'll be speaking on operative management of scaphoid fractures. So let's come to the acute scaphoid fractures first. Quickly, I'll I'll I'll. So my talk is more focused on operative technique rather than going on into the details of the classifications and indications. So one of the commonest indication is when we see a displaced fracture of the scaphoid, which is as recommended now is greater than one millimeter of displacement is, is better to fix. If there is a 15 degree of a humpback deformity, which usually we see in the CT scans or lateral view of the X-rays, if the radial unit angle is more than 15 degree, intra-scaphoid angle is greater than 35 degree or it is associated with perilunate dislocations. So in general, these are the indications when we go for the fixation of the scaphoid. So I'm talking of a percutaneous fixation first, when which we do in acute scaphoid fracture, which is which is a retrograde uh, percutaneous fixation. So what we use is a 17 gauge hypodermic needle, which acts as a sleeve for your guide wire. So this is a uh, a young gentleman who has a waist fracture slightly more proximal to the waist fracture which is a fresh injury <clears throat> so this is a, a supine position a hand on a hand table tourniquet is on and you can see there's there's a towel which is rolled around the back of the wrist in order to give a hyperextension and a gentle traction is given to the thumb by an assistant so this is the one mm wire which is used to do the surface marking of the long axis of the scaphoid, which you can see here. And that, that is what I'm drawing is a long axis of the scaphoid. And you check it on the C arm. So that is your first line which you draw. And then similarly, do a lateral view of the wrist. You make a line and you can you can uh, mark it on your C arm and see whether it is going into the center of the scaphoid. Here it is slightly volar. I would like to be a, a bit more dorsal. Sorry. So then you draw your second line. That is the first line again. That is the second line. So whenever there is an intersection of these two lines, that usually corresponds to the entry of your sleeve, which is your hypodermic needle in this particular case when you're doing a percutaneous fixation. So while marking that point, just go a centimeter proximal to that point 
and that is where you get an entry point so that is checking your axis you are giving you you know which direction you have to go when you start drilling so that is an hypodermic needle 17 number needle which usually uh, you get a 0.8 mm guide wire which easily goes into that so a gentle traction has to be given to the thumb which is which is given by the assistant so that your trapezium goes slightly out of the way because you are going through the scapho trapezial articulation and then you feel that bone this is more lateral uh, you will go slightly more medial and when you feel that you are on the bone and make sure then you start drilling and this is uh, this is uh, the guide wire which is being drilled now so again when you when you pass your guide wire make sure you are going according to your surface markings which you have drawn which which more or less are always correct and if you follow that you will make sure that you will be in the center of the scaphoid and that is how the guide wire is passed into the into the proximal pole and it's always when you feel you have a resistance that means you are there in the proximal pole and now that is uh, that is your lateral view now do you take a same length wire again which you always have in the set and then that is how you measure you can use a measuring device directly i usually prefer to do like this you put us another guide wire a same length like we do uh, always do uh, and then you measure uh, the length of the screw and that is measurement of the screw so once you measured the length the desired length of that screw then you slightly advance your guide wire into the proximal pole into the joint so that when you drill so your guide wire does not come out uh, when you when you your drill exits the bone so that because it's very difficult to put the guide wire in the same track so that is uh, now the drilling is done very important tips here are that when you drill you should be parallel to your guide wire your axis should not change like this so this is a wrong thing when you when you drill try to drill in an eccentric way there are very high chances you can break break the guide wire and if it breaks it's it's a mess to remove it again so go straight like this don't angulate it while drilling this is again a wrong thing so you have to go straight <clears throat> so that is that is how uh, you drill inside and i'll just forward it a bit and that is that is a sleeve which is usually uh, when you use this is an ao synthes herbert screw so they have a marking there are three markings and once you fix that uh, sleeve outer sleeve into the head of the herbert screw that gives you a good indication that where your screw is when you are screwing it inside so when you are on the green marking that means your head is completely buried inside the bone and then you are you, you you are not worried about that prominence of of the herbert screw which sometimes happens because when we uh, take a longer screw it's it's a problem it can be prominent so that is pushing in your screw and and that is these are the marking so when your marking is flush to the sleeve the sleeve which you are using that means your head is the head of the herbert screw is is completely buried inside which is always recommended to do so then you remove the guide wire and that is a single stitch usually is required to close this so post operatively i usually keep them in a splint for a week or so and and, and mobilize as as early as possible that is that is the whole idea so those are the post operative x rays so important tips i think out of this is that you should not drill eccentrically when you are doing a percutaneous fixation you can break the wire there is there are many papers regarding the length of the screw so assessment of the screw on table once you measure you can do it it is usually equal to the middle phalanx of your ring finger so always tend to go couple of millimeters on a shorter side because you can't see a cartilage on a cm usually when we start measuring and this is the sleeve which i was talking about so when you are on the green marker that means your head is out when you are on the yellow that means it is flush to the bone when you are on the red that means the head is buried inside so intraoperatively taking views is also very important usually four views are good enough you take a pa view a lateral view a supination oblique and a pronation oblique view so these four views in all the four views your 
your your screw should be in the in the center your guide wire should be in the center sometimes you need to drill through the trapezium to get the central trajectory however if you if you dorsiflex the wrist adequately you give a traction to the thumb your trapezium will slightly move away and you can get a point in the scaphoid tuberosity usually from which you can enter so not always necessary you need to drill through the trapezium an anti rotation wire sometimes is required especially when we are doing non unions when there's a big bone graft in the middle there are chances of you know popping out of the graft so you can once your graft is inside you can i'll show in the non union slide so you can you can put an anti rotation wire and uh, then put a herbert screw so always avoid this this is a bigger screw probably what we use for the capitulum uh, fractures uh, if we push in bigger screws there are chances of you may displace the fracture so quickly coming on to the scaphoid non unions so scaphoid non union is is completely different we always need open reduction so what 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 we how how do we diagnose and how to approach is so first try to find out where the non union is is it a waist is it a proximal pole or is it a distal pole look for the flexion deformity look for the shortening you can always compare it to the other side x rays that will help give you the length of the scaphoid and you have to look for the avn of the proximal bone because sometimes which can be there and for that you may have your procedure may change so whenever there is a waist and a distal pole non union a volar approach is recommended whenever there is a proximal non union a dorsal approach can be done however it can be done by a volar approach as well so this is an incision like we do in a distal and radius fracture you go slightly lateral to the fcr tendon and you have to cross the wrist crease here and once you you once you on to the bone then that is the non union which you can see here that is a cleft and you can see both the fragments are collapsed so so usually a non union goes into a flexion you see a dorsal cortex is intact and a volarly it is collapsed so one good technique is you put a guide wire in a proximal pole like how i have put to joystick it and then you put another guide wire into the distal pole so this is another wire uh, into the distal pole you can use a 1 mm or a 1.2 mm wire and then you open the fracture side and then is how that that is how you can adequately see how much the defect is that is how it is being checked so so put two wires and then you manipulate because otherwise it's very difficult to to manipulate and go into the fracture side and because you have to you have to remove all the fibrous tissue so that is again showing the same thing so joysticking of fragments with with wires and once you have adequately opened the fracture site then you use a high speed burr which is a very good tool to remove all the fibrous tissue till you see the dead till you see the bleeding bone till you to do you remove the all the fibrous tissue and then you defect then 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 you see the defect and then actually that's how uh you inspect how much graft is needed to fill that defect so once your debridement is done you check how much is the defect there and then you take your uh, bone graft usually graft can be taken from the lower end of radius from the olecranon from the iliac crest most of the time my personal choice is always iliac crest because you get a good cortical strut which which is needed in most of the cases because when we see in late presentations you you, you there is significant collapse and you need a you need a good strong graft so that is a graft uh, from the iliac crest and you 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 have to shape it in a anterior wedge kind of a thing because we know that defect is more volarly and dorsally it is less so the triangular shape so that it opens up the volar side of the scaphoid so to correct that humpback deformity and that is how you push in your graft and once you are happy with that you think it is stable you can you can hammer it with uh, with your small pediatric handsets you'll have to uh, use and you 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 hammer it and make sure that it is jam packed between the two fragments so usually we have seen many papers published in literature which suggest you use a slightly oversized graft and you don't do any internal fixation it's just a peg grafting and it becomes so stable that you don't even need to put k wires or screws so that is how your idea should be when you approach and make sure that the graft is very well stable 
before your internal fixation. So that is how the Siam picture usually looks like at this stage. This is the proximal pole, this is the graft, and this is the distal pole. And this is before the fixation. Like I told you, you check all the <clears throat> stability, do the range of motion and see whether the graft is not popping out. It is well stable and the length of the scaphoid has been achieved. And in this particular case, we have used an anti-rotation wire, like I told you, because there are chances that there may be, you know, slipping out of the graft later on. So for, for at least four weeks, you use a K wire so that it remains in place. And that is, uh, that is the four months of uh, old x-ray of this particular patient. You know, you see the uh, graft is very well in, in, incorporated and there's no arthritis, radioscapoid, and the patient is doing pretty well. So in a summary, a percutaneous technique is a reliable method to fix acute scapoid fractures. Non-unions do heal if you address the problems correctly. Sometimes you may have to do a vascular graft if you see that there is no bleeding in the proximal pole, which sometimes is an issue. An optimal use of fluoroscopy helps in the proper placement of the screw, especially in the percutaneous fixation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. I can see you. Hi. Yeah. Anand, sir, you can start with your presentation. Sir, you need to unmute. Anand, sir, please unmute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Can you see the slides? <coughs> no? No? Can you see the slides there? No? Yeah, slides are not visible. Slides are not visible. You, you they are not visible on, on screen there? No. Okay, I, th I think I'll, I'll just come back and join again because I think they've gone on a sleep mode and I'm on a full screen. So it'll take me a minute. If Dr. Khalid wants to finish off two minutes there, he was uh, his... Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so I, I'll, I'll just rejoin. Would that be all right? Okay. But Khalid, you can start. Sir. I don't know from where I got snapped. <laughs> <laughs> so I will start from our approach, what I do usually. So, hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what I have made, I have combined all the classifications and made a little bit modifications. So for infected non-unions, what I have done is with bone loss, I have divided it into two with no or but Khaled, non. Uh, screen, uh, share your screen, please. Yeah, I think I have shared it. Is it shared now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for non-infected infected non-union, non what I have done is I have divided the non-unions into two types, with bone loss or without bone loss. In no bone loss, we have a no or non-stiff deformity and a stiff deformity. For a no deformity or a non-stiff deformity with no bone loss, I usually do a debridement, put antibiotic bone cement for some time and put an X-fix, either a normal X-fix or an LRS. Then at stage second, I will remove the bone cement and do bone grafting. Or if there is ex uh, absolutely no bone defect, then I can do, usually do a Elizabeth technique, accordion technique. For a stiff deformity, I do a gradual correction over an Elizabeth frame. And after correction of deformity, you can treat it as no, no deformity. 
with bone loss uh, there can be again no or no on stiff deformity and a stiff deformity for stiff deformity you do a gradual correction over elizero frame and for non stiff deformity you do debridement antibiotic bone cement transport or a masculate for example this is a case rta open fractured tibia initially managed elsewhere by fixator then put on cast cast was removed on examination there were no signs of infection or a short limb and there was a short limb cbc esr and crp infection markers were okay this is the x ray patient having bone loss and a non union so this is a non infected bone loss non infected non union with bone loss and no deformity options here will be lengthening over a nail acute docking and transport over an lrs frame or elizero frame or a masculate so what i did is i transported it this is final at 11 month and this is the video of patient walking another case a 50 year old female patient rta 2 months ago suffered an open fracture initially managed somewhere else when she visited us she had exposed bone ends with a dry wound with little granulation tissue with a fixator on cbc esr crp was normal so this was a quiescent infection because it had a grand open granulation tissue bone loss and no deformity why i am saying bone loss is because this bone was infected and at debridement this had to be removed so what we did we again did an lrs did a acute docking closed the wound and transported this is union at 8 months this is her knee flexion and limb length and this is the walking video this is a uh, unique case 57 year old man attended our hospital with the exposed start i think this is a what hello Hello, yeah, Hello, Hello, there is an issue with with your internet. Am I audible? Yes, now, please. Okay. 57 year old attended our hospital with exposed unusual tibial shaft fracture. Patient gives history of incision drainage for abscess over tibial shin. Skin necrosis led to an exposed tibial shin. when dressings could not heal the wound drill holes were made into the shin to encourage granulation tissue these drill holes led to fracture of tibia shaft this was an infected no bone loss no deformity what we did is we debrided patient was initially put on abony cast with the window for dressings there was no improvement so this was an actively infected no bone loss no deformity i did there are two techniques either you could do a accordion or radical debridement with mescule or a distraction osteogenesis and transport we did accordion i put a elizero frame did distraction for few minutes, few days then compression for few days after few cycles this started uniting and final follow up 8 months showed a united fracture and this is one year follow up patient fully weight bearing with healed wounds and no discharge this is a 9 years old child entrapment in landslide open tibia fracture with bone loss initially patient put on fixator skin held healed completely when i saw this case he was like this 10 weeks in external fixator non infected bone loss and no deformity so there are options of transport or a mescule over there what i did here was i so the fibula was a little bit thick i put fibula into the defect and covered it it in the cancellous bone graft with the same fixator on the fixator was later removed and put in cast 8 months post op the fibula had incorporated and after 18 months this was totally tibialized this is weight bearing and this is his video which he sent via whatsapp because he lives in a far off place 
there is limb length discrepancy but he does not want to correct that total we have done around 10 cases in last 3 years age group from 14 years to 60 years infected non union 6 with bone loss 5 with stiff deformity 2 1 on aox 6 2 on ring fixators 2 on hybrid fixations and 5 limb reconstruction systems bone transport was done in four cases one acute deformity correction one fibular grafting one compression distraction and four cases of stabilization and compression union time was 27.6 weeks average time for fixator was 19.5 weeks we divided the hindrances during treatment into problems obstacles and complications like pale problems were difficulties that required non operative intervention we had loosening of frame we did not require no uh, operative intervention because it was loosening of locking bolt equinus was in one joint stiffness in ankle 2 and knee 1 poor regenerate due to fast turning one obstacles we had two pin infections which needed removal and change last wala dusra hai one frame loosened which needed stabilization complications one ankle stiffness with varus two patients had limb length discrepancy of 3 cm mm -hmm. we can correct that but patients are not willing to get corrected we had none failure thank you sir you were audio is mute we can start with your presentation sir your audio Hi. was mute are you ready sir yeah yeah um please. let me uh... No, no. I think uh, it is. Khalid, going... stop yeah. sharing your screen. Okay. Yeah. Can you see it? No. We cannot. Uh, I've got on share on the share screen. This. Just don't. Coming up there, no? No sir, no. Hmm. Now? Not yet, sir. Ah oh, yes, yes, we can see it. Now? Then put on cast. Cast was removed on examination. There were no signs of infection or a short. Oh, geez. Yes, sir. You can. You can see the yes. slide. Yeah, yeah. Kindly go. So I just go uh, ahead. Presenter view. Yeah. Shall I go ahead? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm sorry for all the glitches and thank you. Can you hear me? Can you see the slides? Yes, sir. No. No. Yes. Can you? Yes. All right. Oh, thank. You. Thank you very much for the invite to all my good friends sitting in uh, Jammu and. Uh, Uh, a special thanks to professor anil gupta i've known him for a long time to uh, professor sanjeev gupta and uh, professor gani um and uh, uh, there are so many others uh, but i don't want to you know you start taking names and then you start forgetting names and all this so thank you for i don't uh, you know because of the time lag i don't get too much involved with a lot of teaching i'm part of the jammu trauma society Uh, and my lecture today is on unconscious bias which was very well accepted in the charter day meeting they asked me to talk on something as a senior examiner i've been examiner for the college for a long time and examine on the undergrad the postgraduate and i also examine on the mrcs the frcs orthopedics the c cord the e board board exams and uh, the mch uh, part of the teaching teaching program um so what is an unconscious bias 
we all live with our biases. And uh, let me see uh, if I can put a bit of thought into your mind today, this evening. Um, this is a painting which is nearly 200 years plus old. And if you look at the examiner's face, it's priceless. Unfortunately, we cannot do, uh, we cannot have a face like this in front of the exam, uh, uh, in front of a candidate in an exam now. They have changed the whole system with psychometrics, with uh, patient, uh, uh, you know, with, with um, um, what is called uh, different kind of uh, um, study on examiners and their reaction and the study on the candidates. So the psychometric of exams is very much in, involved in it. And that's the way it has evolved in the last decade in the um, Royal College of Surgeons. The four Royal College of Surgeons and the College of Physicians got involved and then they have standardized this. Why do we have biases? I mean, it is normal to have biases. We are not born with it. We all over the world, human beings are nearly the same. And uh, with a caste, color, creed, you know, religion, whatever you talk about, human beings are human beings. And we are fed these biases as, as little children. And these then grow up into bigger problems as we grow up. Can you all hear me? In, in, in group, uh, in, in everything that you would find is an in-group and an out-group. And uh, it's always nice to have an in-group and uh, be part of an in-group. And uh, nobody wants to be part of the out-group, as you can see in this. The out group is doing all the work while the in group is sitting there. So biases turn to be creating issues in in among colleagues and among other people also when you are and when you are examining, it is between the um, the examiner and the candidates. Europe is known for its stereotype, and you know, in we talk about the Irish business sense, but we also talk about the British fortitude. Although UK has moved out of the eu but you still we still have uh, that the that you can see that you cannot geographically separate the british out of europe and we have our danish creativity and we talk about dutch tolerance and so our stereotypes are very much there but still we would say that these uh, uh, do not matter when it comes to a european union so when we talk about our biases we talk about an iceberg, and I always give this example as what is this? It's a conscious aware and it's an unconscious unaware. And when he, you know, if you look at this person who comes in front of you as a candidate, you might find this person a guy or a girl as a, you know, a great person because they have something that's just very familiar. You know, let's talk about a school tie they're wearing, which you recognize a phrase, let's say in Jammu, you somebody is speaking some language and you suddenly pick it that, oh, I would say he's from this place and familiar mannerisms which help you uh, to find and zero in a more that you, you identify this candidate more. I take an example of Dr. Octopus. Can everybody hear me there? Hello? Yes, sir. All right, okay, thanks, thanks. Um, I, uh, Dr. Octopus from Lego, uh, and it is interesting that this is, it has a number of limbs. So why are limbs in Dr. Octopus? It's only an example. Dear friends, it's the limbic system, and actually limbs don't come from limbic system in the brain. Limbic system deals with our emotions and our behavior. And to be very frank, limbus means or in, in Greek, a boundary. So it is between the, the, the bigger cerebral cortex and the diencephalon that the limbic system sits. And it's all to do with our behavioral and emotional workup that we deal with every day. That's what the limbic system does. And sometimes, sometimes we are told that uh, Facial expressions, your voice, your gesture, your word choice, your eye contact, uh, these are important and they give a lot of cues yeah, as it's called a body language. But I, th I would say that all of them are important. When you are examining a candidate, your most important thing is you have to be very careful of you don't give wrong cues. 
We all have our micro inequities, and these are actually micro behaviors, which tend to sometimes discourage or exclude people. You know, it's interesting enough sometimes. I remember as an under, undergraduate, uh, going through exams in India, and sometimes we would be told that this professor, if he rolls his eyes, you are in trouble. <laughs> it really is is an issue that you know these things have moved on, and with time, we have been you know human factors have moved in, and now there's so much of studies done that you know you have to have the the correct uh, body language when you're dealing with um, a candidate. So you have to make sure that your micro inequities do not come in front. Um, and there are micro affirmations, which are very much a good behavior, or you know, you encourage a candidate by nodding, smiling, good eye contact, or positive and encouraging tone of voice is always, always good, and um, gives the candidates a very good chance to feel very confident about the way they want to go through the exams. Our biases, we start with affinity bias, and it is we tend to ignore the negative traits of people. Suppose we like a candidate, we tend to then, you know, gloss over the mistakes they do. And if you don't like a candidate, then we would focus on their faults and we just go on after them because we, we, we somehow uh, this has worked um, in, in our mind. Now the biases, you know, when you talk about biases, there are two ways of looking at biases. There's nothing wrong in having biases, but you, as, as long as you understand that you have it. So there are two ways of reacting in a human brain. One is a slow bias, and then there's a faster bias. Um, and the slow, uh, the, the faster one is very important where you have to make quick decisions. And these decisions are important because they are the ones which you have to use sometimes save you know these are over a million of year in, uh, in human brain have developed and mostly fight or flight then there are other bias and the, the the slow biases where we work up and then we come to a conclusion but not every time we can come to a conclusion it takes a long time the halo effect is the interesting part i'm pretty sure everybody can recognize james bond there from Ian Fleming, James Bond, a fictional character, but he's, I think, the most crossed movies in the world, uh, in Hollywood, if you look at. And when you think of James Bond, he's the smartest guy. He can get us out of all the trouble, a handsome, a very fit physique. Everything is positive. So this is a halo effect. Some candidates come in and they have a halo effect. And you look at them and the halo effect comes from the medieval all paintings where you see all these saints with a halo on them as if the heavens, the, the lights of heaven is dancing on their face and they have something very extraordinary about them. And then sometimes we have our behavioral confirmation. This is another very interesting part in which you, you tend to find something in a candidate and you go after the person uh, even when in this case, you would see that this lady has, uh, she says she's beat, she has, you know, fought against anorexia, but she's on the overweight side. And now when you look at it, she should be a candidate who should be fine because, you know, what you're looking for is somebody who has, is a winner who's, who's uh, taken anorexia. But then you do not like something about this. And unfortunately, sometimes um, the way someone looks or the way, and there have been a lot of studies of uh, of overweight people not liking, or people don't like overweight uh, people. And then they have looked at whether overweight people would like another overweight people, and they say, yes, they are fine with that. So we should be pretty fine. We should not take physical handicaps. We should not take physical uh, how people look and what they wear and how they are. Of course, we, we have to look at people should be decently dressed and exam, but they should, we should not make it too much of an issue. I remember having, um, thinking about tattoos, you know, doctors should not have tattoos, but I was so surprised as a senior trainee in, in London seeing uh, some of the medical students having tattoos. And, you know, this was a bias that was there with me about 12, 13 years ago, it's all finished at this stage. I don't think about this. How does it affect uh, your unconscious bias? You look at exclusions, you look at factions, and then it starts to affect all areas of work. You know, it could affect 
your recruitment of a nice candidate. It could be your performance management of how you deal, how you deal with your staff development and how you reward our promotions. And that can affect the whole and vitiate the whole uh, uh, environment that you work in. Cara Featherstone, when I trained as an examiner in FRC, she's done a tremendous amount of work in a JCI, that's a Joint Commission uh, in inter Intercollegiate Exams, all the FRCS, um, uh, um, orthopedics, urology, plastics, all those exams, and she's done a lot of hard work. She comes with this excellent example where you have to pick the red and the green apples. And, you know, the slide on the left, you pick the red or the green apple, you know, red, let pass the red apples. It's so easy for an examiner to get through and pick the red apples. But when it comes to the, the slide on the right, ladies and gentlemen, you will see that if somebody says, pick the more redder ones, there your biases will start working. You might think, mm, this is a bit more red, but it looks a bit pockmarked. This doesn't look like a great apple, but I, just, I don't know whether I should get this through. And you know, that's the way your biases work. They are always invisible. You do not even know, and they are working behind in your mind all the time. And aggravating factors, the best known is halt, hungry, angry, late, and tired. If you know about the these that you you are hungry and uh, an excellent uh, work was done by the US parole board they looked at all the judges and they looked at all the paroles and they saw that the judges just before the lunch break most of them would were declining the paroles for you know the under trial prisoners or the uh, prisoners who have been uh, who had applied to the parole board and just after lunch they looked at all the parole applications and many of them got through so a uh, hungry examiner is of course a difficult it would can be a uh, not the right frame of mind to you know but i've i've seen that some examiners are very consistent they would be marking and they go for the whole day of exams with a lot of consistency how do we tackle our unconscious biases? I think a lot of work is done, mindfulness that comes from the, the from Southeast uh, part of the world. So nicely it has been picked up in the Western world. They've repackaged it completely. And now mindfulness is, is a big thing that they have to, they, they, they talk about all the time. I think the important thing is you have to look at is that whether you are able to challenge your belief, is this always true? Do you have any evidence? Where did it come from? Is this really logical, the way you're coming to or deriving your, your decisions in exams? You be positive. I think micro affirmations really, really work very well. As long as you consciously try to contract your micro inequities, you are tired, but still then a smile on your face is always, always a nice way to go ahead um, as an examiner, there are a huge number of environmental factors. Always, a lot, always have a tick box of allowing enough time. You know, encourage your peer review. And this is peer review thing is uh, is interesting that I found that in some of the exams that I sat in, the eBoard, CCOT, and the FRC source. I think MRCS doesn't do much of peer review, but uh, in that they have another, they pair examiners, they always pair a senior and a junior examiner. And that way you are able to balance your thoughts very well. You can, you know, exchange notes that what you thought about, you get, you get a lot of uh, teaching and training with your um, peer examiner and they are able to, you know, help you with your biases when you, get distracted you think about something and they will say no that's not important you know the important is what the candidate was talking about in the exams and you know that really helps you big time uh, in the end the take-home message would be be aware and recognize bias you we ladies and gentlemen we all live with it every day we have it we do see different people you know in different forms of life and we have to be careful that not let our biases work you know, learn to challenge your thinking, use intentionally positive behavior, create the right environment and make contact with diverse colleagues. There's nothing better than having a diversity at workplace that really, really helps you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, we can request Dr. Arbi Kalia to start with the presentation. <laughs> Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure to be again with all of you. And uh, I'll be talking about something which is uh, probably uh, very different from normal kind of uh, presentation. I was asked to do something hatte by Dr. Ghani. So I'll be talking about my journey about a new implant that we have been developing and uh, it is known as the patellar locking display. So the learning objectives would be how to identify a problem and come up with a solution. And then uh, for us, uh, what is the process of designing a new implant? And then this is where the difficulty starts, how to start the process. And we will share a few of the difficulties and roadblocks we face. Then how to find an industry partner so that you should be able to transfer your technology. So we started looking at patellar fractures and what we realized was that despite the best possible treatment, uh, we still have poor outcomes in a large number of patients like uh, significant knee pain, construct failure, and uh, very common is prominent uh, uh, hardware, and which is, which is causing functional impairment. Uh, most biomechanical studies support plate osteosynthesis because they have improved loads to failure and reduced fracture capping. Uh, however, uh, plates uh, are not really there for the patellar fractures in common use, and most of us have been trained with the tension band wearing and its variations. So this is the kind of uh, thing that we do. We put screws from one fragment to another. Sometimes we pass wire through the screws and. Uh, we all hope that uh, it will do well. But then you have a group of patients who have combinatorial fractures. And then you really uh, show your skill and put things together, wires, hair wires, screws from here to there. And hopefully at the end of the day, you have a stable reconstruction. But uh, it is not easy. Sometimes it is impossible. And often these patients will end up with Atelectives, which is not a good idea anyway. So there is a compromise and combination is there. And then you have done all kinds of things. And then the problem that you're going to face is you're going to face problems of why the soft tissues, the loops of the wires, uh, sometimes they have come out as well of the skin and other things also keep on happening, which are anterior pain. So this is the uh, basic, the standard, gold standard rather for a transverse fracture. Uh, it is shown that it doesn't really transform the tension forces into compression forces. And it just acts like a tie. And uh, that traditional AO teaching that tension forces get converted to compression forces on loading doesn't really work because biomechanical studies recently have proved that this does not happen. So it's just like tying down a fracture and wiring it together. And uh, since it's cancellous bone, more often than not, it does unite. There are very various modifications to it. You can put screws, you can put wires to screws, and so on and so forth. Uh, but all of them have a problem that more often than not, you need a wire. So there is no really definite solution for combinatorial fractures. Uh, you have to use the ingenuity as a surgeon, and uh, probably that is what uh, uh, we all do. And, uh, and then we hope for a probably a good kind of a result. So various kinds of plates have also been designed, all shapes. Uh, plates uh, are not really there for manufacturers uh, in common use, and most of us have been with the tension band wearing and So, this is the uh, uh,
I think there's a problem with the uh, network on the RB Kaliya side. So we'll go to the next session, which is going to be moderated by uh, Dr. Anu. Question and answers for me. All the participants can ask questions or they put uh, them in the chat box. We can ask them later also. can start with Dr. Ashish Kulia. Is he there? He hasn't joined yet. So can we just go on with the next speaker? Dr. Ramesh Sen? Dr. Bhavok? Yeah, both are here. So whom, whom do you want to start? Dr. Ramesh Sen can start, I think. Dr. Ramesh Sen is, yes, Dr. Ramesh can start, please. Yeah, quite okay. okay. Thank you. Dr. Ramesh Sen, just put on your video. Yeah, as yeah we can see you, sir. So, can I share the screen now? Yes, you can share your screen, sir. Is it visible? Yes, sir. We can see it. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about something that why I love to keep my data. I am relating to a place which is not far away from Jammu, that is Mani Mahesh. If you know, there is a place, there is a lake at the height of 5,653 meters. And its base came from where we start climbing is 6,000 feet from the sea level. And at that time, I was a resident in department of SPM. And uh, we had those Rome's camp. If you, a senior of you will remember that vehicle, the white vehicles, which came to every hospital, every medical college at that time uh, and given to PSM department for such a meeting. And there we, our professor Das Gupta, who was my medical medicine professor, he was with us in this camp asked us why we don't go to that level at which most people go to 13,000 height. So we started, we were six, seven, eight people over there with one professor of psychiatry and all people, we climbed that height from 6,000 to 13,000 height. And then our professor asked, asked me, why can't we keep, took their, everybody's blood pressure and record that data at base level and that up level, and then we come back. And that is what I did at that stage. I mean, that was uh, uh, using the data of our blood pressure, simple study, while we were ascending from 6,000 to 13,000 height and coming back. And that he asked me, now you have got the data, write a letter to editor because it's a small work. So I wrote that letter to editor and it was published in Journal of Association of Vision of India. And this is the person who gave me the first blessing to do something at that time. Now, that was one part. Subsequently, I was a resident in orthopedics department and I saw this case. And I think all of us see these cases. It looks to be a very standard kind of epidetic Montegia, which you tend to see it over, nothing very special. Then you see another case. Again, it doesn't really bother you much. You see routinely such kind of a cases. So you just see, yes, it's okay. I'm talking about 1985 at that stage. But when you see both these things together, now this was something interesting for me, how it must have happened and what should be the mechanism of such a thing. Anyway, at that time, most of the time we were doing close reduction. I did a close reduction after looking at these x-rays, what were my options. And as an interesting case, I kept its records. I did its close reduction. I applied POP cast. I followed this case up and this is the follow-up x-ray of this case. So after some months, another case with similar kind of an injury came, proximal Montegia and a distal fracture. And then that case again, I mean, this was after some months, but uh, this has it taken me an interest. I took these records also. And after further few months, I had another case of the same kind because now I was keen to see this kind of an injury. I got another case, 
similarly mid shaft fracture and a distal facial injury and another case and then it started that whenever i was finding something but they were at a years interval one year another year but i was keen whenever such a case came i recorded it put in my records and started seeing it and then i kept on seeing another case there was a complication also in one of the cases with the conservative management it did not unite and gave us a complication also then by that time 10 years 15 years later i was still accumulating these cases it is no study i was just collecting these cases uh, data of a patient data of a patient and then there came re relatively elder children and we started surgery on them another cases again same kind of a manifestation when I had all those 15 cases in four cases i did not have these follow up records but i had 15 cases in, and they were i this data i collected in a period of 24 years this very specific interest of a double injury into forearm I classified them. But before that, I was keen what is in the literature about this injury. Then I found that if I look at the literature, there are only eight case reports in the total world literature of this combination of an injury. And I had 15 cases in my records of this injury of that data, which I accumulated in a period of 24 years. So I thought it's worth publication and I published it way back in 2011. Yes. And we even classified them. We even advocated what is the kind of management in this kind of a injury. And so that is something without a proper research. And then this is the another thing. In Shimla, where I was studying as a postgraduate student, we used to see Osgood Schlatter disease, a very insignificant kind of a problem, but it affects those children at that age group who complain about it. So we all know that this is a standard. You give some days rest, maybe maximum you apply plaster for some time, give they tend to rest, they come, become comfortable. But in Shimla, in my college, we were doing surgery in them of so-called Thompson operation, making a drill hole. That was something interesting because I asked, I used to go to a, some meetings over. I used to ask other people over there, do they ever need surgery? Nobody ever requires surgery. Then why in Shimla we are getting this surgery? And this was interviewing for me. Why this is happening? Why we are, our patients do not settle down with the rest while other people settle down? So I started looking at, I recorded all those data of all those cases, which I was continuously regularly seeing over, seeing over, seeing over. And what I found, I was looking at the disease pathology, why these children are not settling down. And then what is there in hill areas, probably, that they do not settle down. There must be some excessive force over the TBL tendon, which is pulling it up. And then looked at all that data which I had collected because I was keen to know about those things. So what I found, if you look here at the patellar apex, in the affected patient, non-affected patient, you find little different in the apex of the patella. So I made it an angle. You can see what I proposed a new angle that if I take this angle, this was coming to be 30 degree and in a non-affected side, it was 46 degree, even in the same patient. So I have all the data recorded and I sent it to Acta Orthopedica Scandinavica in 1988 and it got published. And that was my first publication. And this, they, they were not happy with the quality of X-ray. They asked me to send me one X-ray in which normal and the abnormal sides are there. I send it and they published it. And you see these four teachers, the three teachers of mine, all my 22 publications during my residency carries the same name profile, Ramesh Kumar Sen, Ella Sharma, Esther Thakur, and VP Lakhanpal, my three, my teachers, and myself, all my papers are like, because my data was given by all of them Everybody's OPD, any case of false good strategies come, sent to Dr. Say, sent to Dr. Say. So I was getting all that data from my teachers. And then after the first paper, I got the opportunity of seeing one that there is a Western Pacific Orthopedic Association conference in Yokohama. I thought why not to have more publication by sending into an abstract book. So I sent a paper to them also that I want to present a case. This is I got a mail from Tomi Hisha Kosino, who was the organizing chairman. He accepted my paper and he wrote me that your paper idea is so good that I am making you a faculty. I will provide you airfare. I'll provide you all local hospitality. You must come. And you know what this data was giving me? 
as a resident from a small medical college in india i was a faculty in an international meeting while as a resident there i was a faculty and there you can see i am me sitting along with all other persons over that dais so you can see what made it then luckily i met dr shobha aruna who is right now in rishikesh she was there working as uh, she was there as a pediatric orthopedic fellow she met me she got me that you want to see other medical college i went to tokyo medical college but now i want you to look at this person he is subir sen gupta from malaysia he is the father of malaysian orthopedics because he was the first orthopedic surgeon there he started orthopedics over there he was also interested in this disease he says you have got a good idea you come over to our department so i went to their department i went to their theaters and eventually the happened that they kept on inviting me multiple time and we kept on exchanging they asked my cv and with that cv they invited me to be their examiner for their post graduate courses and this is the first examiner they invited me was 2009 you can see professor subir sen gupta with rest of the department and the second time i went for their look the position they gave me because as an examiner they made me at the best possible position to be there within the, these are all examiners over there and they have got a very good system probably uk has got that the same system anand bhai that but all 54 examiners are evaluating all students of the whole of the malaysia in orthopedics in one center and there i was there another international examiner sitting with me was from uh, thailand and rest all over the north and they listened to your external examiners and that was a fantastic thing which i got over there in that kind of a situation then further data i am not looking at a organized research i am looking for just collection of my cases so i collected lot of cases of talus fracture in last 6 years i got best paper award for those talus fracture and again come back to the x rays i don't know whether you recognize what is special about this x ray but i was little interested to see what is happening this is something different it is not classical supracondylar it is not classical humerus fracture it is somewhere in between and i try searching is do we have specific name of it then another case and subsequently another case and subsequently another case now this is not supracondylar this is not diaphyseal it is somewhere in the metaphysis and somehow literature there was nothing of this kind of a fracture pattern this in the six in five years i had six uh, cases of this very character the level was different the combination was different and I, again i started searching is it described i did not find it to be described but in 2008 i got one paper which is described taking it as humeral metaphyseal diaphyseal junction fractures and immediately we were ready with our cases you can see on the ground with the reference of they had given we also put up as a metaphyseal diaphyseal junction fracture of hc humerus so i am saying is that it is just a collection of cases just the data which i was accumulating were giving me papers rather than any organized study which you do now another because of interest in collecting unusual cases this is a data of fracture epiphyseal separation of distal humerus collected over many years because you don't get so many then this traumatic separation of the physis again five cases of the type 1 injury which i had collected gave me a paper another a person sustaining a nail uh, sustaining a fracture getting a uh, nail subsequently sustaining another motor vehicle accident and getting a fracture at the distal tip of the nail it was a very classical kind of a presentation we were uh, stabilizing it in a very classical way again there were five cases in a long span of period i collected all of them and then scapulothoracic dissociation not a very common thing but we saw a collection of those cases coming to us and we made a very important kind of a observation that those patient with subclavian artery injury had more frequently a complete brachial plexus involvement whereas those with the axillary artery involvement sustained more often a partial plexus injury because at the time of injury we hardly know about the neurological outcome but this paper gave us that kind of an indication then glenoid fossa i mean these are not routine injuries you get them rarely but if you keep and collecting the data for a longer time you are able then this breaking k wires i was removing them from inside again this kind of it at what i want to say is that this data when i was accumulating for a long period without a very specific interest just out of curiosity curiosity i was collecting and now come to this femur head fractures we know uh, series were first case reports then 33 fracture then 42 fractures 
by 2011 only 365 fractures were reported world over and what happened because at my place i started in 1995 in pgi where this was the first case i saw obviously it was a little unusual i recorded it and then there is another case similar type in this case this was 6 years follow up and this is 17 years follow up so the case which i was speaking up i was recording all this data to as long as possible with 17 years follow up another case and you see 14 years follow up another case you see uh, this fracture and again 12 year follow up so meaning by you focus on the patient you focus on a problem you keep on observing him and in a period i had my own collection of 140 cases of femur head fracture which is as per the literature one of the biggest collection of femur head fracture world over and what it was giving me you see to it i became a visiting fellow in british orthopedic association manchester conference at one time then i visited germany as a visiting professor i visited toronto as a visiting professor i visited uh, this um, university in in uh, this usa two universities i visited as a visiting professor and everywhere they wanted my femur head fractures then i visited another place i visited colombia i visited ethiopia i visited turkey i visited taiwan again i was presenting was femur head fractures then israel karachi new zealand malaysia wherever people because at one conference i remember in israel i presented femur head fracture the person from latvia was very happy to see my work he says you come to latvia in the baltic state meeting you do present your, your femur head fractures then we had its publication in the jbjs also at that stage and now i have got a final publication of all my cases in uh, in a journal also so meaning by i was not doing any research i was only at the base of that evidence the case series or case reports this data is only of the case reports so which is something which all of us are getting and i was just accumulating and this data gave me everything what i had desired to get a kind of a status i kind of a travel around i kind of a recognition by simple accumulation of my simple cases over a long period of time and that is i have been able to publish more than 225 in which 130 are in pubmed itself and have been present able to present at in 400 lectures world over in 25 countries and that was from the time when we did not have that much of a internet availability we did not have digital documentations of that kind but my data gave me every availability i know you see this cartoon just rubbing sticks together for fun never realizing i was doing a basic research thank you Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you. Thank Thank you. 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 Unmute, please. Yeah, I'm on. I'm on. Just give me a second. I'll just start. Sorry for that glitch. Uh, is my are my slides visible? Yeah. Okay, uh, am I audible? Are my slides visible? Hello, yes, sir. Is you audible? Okay. Okay. So this was the stage one of our uh, journey, and we made initial drawings. These are made by myself by hand, and uh, we envisaged a plate which was uh, designed to match the anterior surface of the patella. It had two hooks in the lower part, 
and there were holes for locking screws on the side and there were two holes in the top which were uh, basically meant for cancel screws. Uh, again, basic design. And this is a side uh, view which shows uh, the uh, superior part that they will bend and accommodate the size of the. Uh, now, this is the thing that we thought uh, this is how clamps in the distal fragment, and this is the clamp in the proximal. And uh, this was uh, what we thought was the final reconstruction that we wanted. So we wanted four screws on the two sides. We wanted two screws from superior to inferior, and we wanted two sharp hooks to take care of our distal fragment. So our plate was designed to precisely match the anterior surface of the patella, and there were locking screws also. So it was combining compression as well as locking. And uh, uh, then the journey started. And we thought this would be a universal solution. It should be affordable, and it should improve patient outcomes. And we launched a patent for this. Uh, it is not just enough to have an idea. Uh, if you have to fortify your idea with funds, and we presented our idea to IIT Roorkee, and we received the funding of 7 lakh rupees. Uh, one of the important things that they wanted us to do was that we had to start our own private company. So we started this company, designed the logo, and this is the website of our company. Then we started working on it more seriously, and these were the CAD drawings that we created. And they show the basic characteristics of the plate. We added a few holes uh, in the plate so that uh, these can be used for suture fixation for fragments which are not uh, able to capture in the screws. And this was the design that we did. We diverge that and uh, the screws became divergent by about 20 degrees and uh, 10 degrees in the other plane so that they would catch hold of uh, the fragments. And then we did a finite element analysis. This was done in collaboration with CSIO. And uh, we created a finite element of the uh, distal femur and patella. And we uh, digitally did the surgery on this. And this is how it looked on finite element analysis creation. These are the screws. These are the locking head screws. Everything was created. So once... Uh, uh, we did that, realized that there were very stresses in the body and the root of the hook. So we redesigned it, the edges were removed and the thickness of the plate was increased. The gradual thickness of the hook was eliminated and the tapering was redesigned. And this is how the final CAD drawing looked. And then we went ahead and made the initial prototype. So this is a real plate which has been made and it has been put onto a patella and we realized that it is pretty large. So we need different sizes. And then when the sizes uh, were envisaged, they now they are now in the prototype stage. So the progress that has been made till now was that we have signed a non-disclosure agreement with Sahara Private Limited and the prototype is almost been finalized and we are planning to look at a very biomechanical study in collaboration with IIT Roorkee. And the journey ahead is pretty long because we still need to compare it with another plate and finally we need to transfer the technology to industry. So the competition that we have is the Arthrex plate, which is imported, expensive, not easily available. And uh, the idea is novel and Indian manufacturers can easily manufacture. And since the competitors are foreign companies, we will have a huge price at one pitch. The target market, there's no clear date, estimated number somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000. Out of these, 20 to 30 percent could be potentially donated. The revenue model is that we will uh, transfer the technology and a small for every implant sold to uh, take care of our costs that we have spent in development. And this is a certificate of recognition which has been given to us by government of India that uh, we are a startup and it was a very proud moment for us when we got this. So to conclude, the journey is long. Collaboration with various partners. A lot of effort is required to innovate. It's not easy to culminate an idea into a reality. The would be anybody wants to do this thing form a team very early. 
and involve them from day one so that it should be an idea of the whole team rather than yours. Then it will be easier for you to rectify. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalia, for a nice talk. Oh, I invite Dr. Rohit Berg for his talk, please. Uh, thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so I will be sharing my experience uh, that how to minimize bleeding in spine surgery. So bleeding in spine surgery actually is a concern. Whatever it involves related to spine, even a percutaneous biopsy can be lead to torrential hemorrhage. So one has to be very cautious uh, with every procedure related to spine. Sometimes we talk about bleeding in spine surgery as a prophylactic measures, and sometimes we have to deal with hemorrhage as a at a war scenario while doing the spine surgery. So for, when we talk about prophylaxis, it is very essential to look at the basic parameters like PT, APTT, uh, liver diseases, what kind of drugs the patient is on. One has to predict that this patient is going to bleed or not. And the positioning of the patient, we all know that how much is this important when we are doing the spine surgery. I'm not going to detail in that. One important aspect is that most of our spine patients, they are either on some sort of, uh, you know, the gabapentins and the pregabalin. And we also know that these pregabalin and the gabapentin, they are on, uh, they are all are uh, the uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And they also affect the platelets by the same mechanisms because the serotonin uptake is very important for the platelet functions. So these uh, uh, gabapentins and the pregabalin, they also increase the risk of abnormal bleeding and one should be very careful while, uh, uh, you know, one should have the concept of uh, the, uh, that, that these patients may bleed more during the surgery. Also, whenever you are operating, you have to be very, very careful about the, uh, the calcified vessels, especially in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. You have to specifically look for in the, especially in, uh, the, 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 the uh, elderly who are more than 50, 60 years, they often have these calcified vessels and, you know, your slight manipulation, they can lead to the rupture of these vessels. So one has to be very, very careful when you correct the lordosis, these vessels, they can stretch anteriorly and they can rupture. Another important thing is that for every tumor, one has to go for the DSA and they should be embolized. So you can see that these are usually quite vascular tumors, uh, they can happen. And preoperative embolization, if you do it, it can lead to, you know, a significant decrease in the bleeding intraoperatively. Uh, just to show you an example, this looks like a very vascular tumor. Um, um, you can see that on the X-rays, but it's a big tumor arising from the lumbosacral junction. And this is the, the CT as well as its, uh, its um, uh, angiography pre-op. And we took out, when we did the, the angio embolization, we could took out the whole of the tumor with just the 300 ml blood loss. And this is the reconstruction. You can see that such a big defect we have created and it was reconstructed uh, without any issue. And this came out to be an infiltrating angiolipoma, which is a very vascular tumor. Coming to the, uh, to, to the, tu the tumors, uh, you know, sometimes you have to plan your surgery in a way that you can escape entering the tumor. So that also leads to, you know, the decreased bleeding during the surgery. Like this is a case of uh, uh, ABC of the, uh, of, the, of the spine. And in this, we plan actually that we entered from the lateral. We didn't open the, the tumor. So we entered from the lateral. We cut the, all the ribs and then we, uh, we cut the pedicle in the, in the, in the last, uh, as, a, as a last part of the last part of the procedure. And you can see that we didn't open the tumor. We just went around the tumor. And then finally, we, we, uh, we cut it off. And uh, by this measure, you can also decrease the, the bleeding by, uh, by making your strategy. Now, this is a case of hemangioma. You can see that it is an aggressive hemangioma, and this is going to the canal. 
uh, the classical literature says that the usual bleeding in these cases is around 3 to 3.5 liters or more than that. But now we have... Uh, uh, we have a very safe technology by which you can uh, by which you can do this these procedures with less than 100 ml blood loss. We just put uh, uh, absolute alcohol uh, during the surgery into these uh, vertebra. One has to be very careful that it can lead to the atrial fibrillation. So one has to be uh, informed the anesthetist when you're injecting. And the other thing is that when you are injecting alcohol, it should be done in 0.25 ml, uh, you know, aliquots, uh, and you have to be do you have to uh, inject two to three ml of alcohol over a period of at least half an hour, so that uh, you can detect any 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 leak or any changes uh, in the heart rate if there is there. So uh, this is just to show you that uh, the effect of the alcohol. So you can see that I put the MCG needle, and this is bleeding like anything. And then we inject the um, the alcohol. This is the absolute call, and we keep on, you know, um, uh, flooding the or operating the the uh, the stay line. And then you open the uh, the, the needle from the other side. You can see that now uh, there is no bleeding from the other side. Such is the effect of the of the alcohol. And then. You perform your laminectomy, uh, and you can decompress the, the, the canal very without any 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 blood loss. So this is the post-operative uh, CT. You can see uh, that uh, the whole of the, the the tumor has actually regressed, and the patient improved uh, uh, neurologically as well. Now this is we know that the hemangiomas they are very common, in the, especially in the third trimester of pregnancy, because there is a uh, pressure on the on the on the vena cava and then this leads to the back pressure and these hemangiomas the hypertrophy these all vessels so this was a uh, pregnant lady who came to us with paraplegia in third trimester so this in this case we also did the same thing but in this case we operated her in the lateral position so this has to be uh, has to be kept in mind that sometimes you may have to operate these patients on a, in a lateral position also if you're going for an anterior approach then one has to be very careful when dealing with these segmental vessels you can see that these segmental vessels, if they are, if they skip from your, uh, you know, the control, then they can bleed uh, exponentially. And then you can either use the uh, the the lig ligature clips or you can use the ligatures to cut them off and to fully secure them. And these they become especially important when you are going for tumor surgeries anteriorly. Uh, one has to be very very careful because these vessels they can be engulfed in the in the tumor itself, and one has to be very careful about uh, these vessels. Now, sometimes when you take out these big, uh, large uh, tumors involving the ribs, so one has to be very, very careful about the intercostal vessels also. And it is always, always prudent to secure them either medially or laterally before, uh, you know, uh, cutting out the tumor. Major vascular injuries, again, as a prophylactic measure, you should always, always study your preoperative imaging. You can take the control of the vessels proximally and distally if you are going to that particular area. If the already the vascular injury has occurred uh, during the uh, during the surgery, then you have limited options. You immediately pack it. You can call your vascular surgeon, and then you can either explore and you can directly repair or graft it, or you can go for the endovascular management uh, depending upon the availability of it at your center. Now, being about careful, you can see that this looks uh, this this is a case of scoliosis, which looks like pretty normal, and this was a case of uh, Marfan syndrome, a usual uh, scoliosis case. But when we, you know, we we uh, put the patient on prone, then you can see actually that when we are exposing, the aorta is almost rotated, and it was just below the transverse processes. So when you actually um, uh, exposing, then also you can injure the, the aorta. You can see here rival that you can see the aorta actually just around the uh, the transverse processes. So one has to be very very careful in these uh, sort of uh, syndromic cases that uh, you know you have to pick up these sacral clues now this is a case of sacral tumor uh, which we operated and you can see that this is in the, in the vascular area so in this area it is always always prudent to have a proximal and the distal control of vessels before approaching the uh, before uh, you know the taking out the tumor and you can use this vascular clip vascular uh, you know the the bands uh, and you can easily control the, the the vessels have a safe control over the vessels Coming to the, the cervical spine, in cervical spine, when you're operating, uh, especially tumors, uh, then these vertebral arteries, they, they become quite important. And you can see that this is an osteochondroma, which is uh, affecting the, obviously, the, uh, the, the transverse foramen area, which is uh, where the vertebral canal, vertebral artery is housed. So this case was very challenging for us. And you can see here 
that uh, this uh, this was in this was just abutting the vertebral artery uh, in this case so in this case we were very careful we were pre very prepared and we actually um, identified the, uh, the the lateral portion of the of the of the of the, uh, of the vertebral artery and we exposed it and we were very careful uh, to to expose the vertebral artery so one has to be very prepared uh, if you are prepared for it then mostly uh, most of the, of the time you are going to uh, get away with it now coming to these uh, difficult cervical deformities uh, like this was a case uh, and uh, this was a girl of 12 years with history of tuberculosis with a big sinus and with a fixed deformity so we corrected it uh, with a front back vertebral column resection and these are the cases especially with tuberculosis you don't have landmarks because everything is fused posteriorly so in this case when we were putting the particular screws uh, again there is the chances of getting the vertebral artery damage so in this case again on the fuse side, on the right side, we changed our strategy to the lateral mass screws, uh, but we did all the correction through on the left side, um, left side particular screws. So you can, again, this is very important to highlight the importance of strategy uh, to prevent the, the bleeding into the uh, uh, intraoperatively. While in this case, we were, uh, we were, we could find all the spaces and we could all the particular screws and in C2 area, we have used the laminar screws. And this is the, uh, you can see these all screws, they were put freehand. And you can see that the uh, the vertebral artery it was avoided in all the uh, all the cases, or, or in all uh, all the screws. Again, when we are dealing with the uh, with the proximal uh, cervical thoracic areas, then uh, we have to be very careful about the arch of the aorta in that uh, that region. Like in this case, the arch of aorta turns in that region only. And again, uh, this was a revision surgery because it, it was operated by neurosurgery for its uh, neural uh, shift also. Uh, so again, this was a challenging and one has to be very, very careful and plan. Uh, we did a vertebral column resection here. Uh, if you are ready for your, uh, your uh, you know, if you know about the vascular anatomy and, and you are ready to, uh, you know, you know, you plan your surgery according to that, then you can avoid all these, uh, these issues. If you even if you have the vertebral artery uh, injury, so it is always always prudent to get a CT angio preoperatively so that you can look at the the uh, the anomalous vertebral artery uh, anatomy. We always always evaluate them preoperatively. If you find that the vertebral artery has occurred in the screw hole, then uh, some authors say that you can just leave the screw there uh, because it will uh, act as a hemostatic screw. But again, it is controversial. Uh, but the only the, one important thing is that if the vertebral artery injury has occurred in an open space, then you have to use tamponade and then you have to call your neurovascular uh, colleagues. They can either directly repair it or they can use the endovascular thing or they can ligate it if, if, if you have evaluated it preoperatively that the, the circle of villus is complete from the other side. Now coming to the various other agents like tranexamic acid, they are very useful in uh, spine surgeries. Uh, in literature, there are various doses and routes. We use 15 milligram per kg IV stat at the induction over 15 minutes and then we give the one milligram per kg infusion per hour. It doesn't have uh, seem to have an effect on bleeding spinal metastasis surgery, but in all other surgeries, including scoliosis, the tranexamic acid has drastically reduced uh, our blood loss. There are some other agents also. We do not have any experience with them. We only use tranexamic acid. Uh, control measures is that sometimes if the bleeding is occurring, then you have to check blood pressure because if sometimes the blood pressure is high, that keep on bleeding. Then you can use uh, various uh, options like gauges, gel form, surgical, bone wax, bipolar cautery. Bipolar cautery is, uh, is very helpful, especially in the control of the, the, the epidural, ble epidural areas. Uh, we also have the molecular resonance cautery because it, 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 the advantage is that it coagulates at less than 50 degrees centigrade. So again, this is very helpful during the spine uh, near near the spinal cord. Uh, we also use the uh, the ultrasonic scalpel. Ultrasonic scalpel also reduces the the blood loss during the surgery. Like this was a three year old boy with very severe uh, congenital kyphosis deformity. We all know that this requires uh, vertebral column resection and the average blood loss in vertebral column resection is around two liters. So, uh, and the, the blood volume of a three-year-old boy is not more than 700 ml. So this was the this thing. And th in this, we use the, this tranexamic acid. And you can see that uh, uh, there is minimal bleeding when we are cutting the, uh, when we're taking out the pedicle. Uh, so this was the case and we could, we could have the good correction in this child. So uh, the coming to hemostatic sponges, there are various sort of sp sponges available in the market. All have their pros and cons, uh, but they all work uh, this thing. And uh, even some people they have described for different areas of the spinal cord, the different types of the, the this thing, but this doesn't matter. We use uh, 
um, most of the time we use the gelatin foam in our practice and they they go, they work very fairly well so if they are bleeding you just pat it around this thing and sometimes you can put your um, uh, the uh, the flow seal also and they they also uh, work very well this like this is a piece, this is a flow seal uh, uh, this which is a from the mixture available we, we pack it with the help uh, with the gel foam and this works beautifully in most of our cases just a word about the controlled hypotension uh, when we are doing a deformity correction we do not advocate hypotension but it can be used during the um, during the exposure part so it helps but once you start correcting the deformity uh, you should uh, raise the mean blood arterial pressure to at least 80 mm of mercury like these these are some of the cases the, the difficult cases uh, you can see the angst pond cases of very severe deformities and they require uh, you know the multiple osteotomy so we have done vertebral column resections and the uh, the the pedicle suppression osteotomy in a single sitting all these cases they were operated without any 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 severe blood loss so these are the some of the cases which you could do with all using all these strategies uh, using vertebral column resections uh, pedicle suppression osteotomy and the the, the smith peterson osteotomies in a, in a single setting in all these cases just by using the uh, all the drastic measures of and controlling the, the keeping the the blood loss i always tell my residents then in spine uh, the time is blood so one has to be very quick and one has to be very thorough with the, your your surgical procedures because the more you keep it open the more uh, you know the the blood loss keeps on occurring other hemodynamic measures like local vasoconstrictors and epidural blockade they have been described and but we don't have any much experience with that but they all work so so hemorrhage during spine surgery can be a big concern prophylaxis is always always better uh, prioritize and strategize uh, make strategies for your surgeries use all possible parameters and do not hesitate to call your vascular friends in case of any vascular injury and it's all a team work thank you Thank you, Dr. Gov, for a nice talk. No other request, Dr. Siddharth Sharma, for his please. Good evening. Am I am I audible, visible, and are my slides visible? So I take that. Uh, yes, please. Carry yeah, on. I, take, I take that as a yes. And thank you, Professor Ghani, Professor Sanjeev Gupta, for giving me the chance. to present a talk here and honestly i am uh, i am so uh, impressed by the the kind of talks that were presented i mean from ranging from a wide variety of educational topics to dr sain's talk dr bhavok's talk and even dr kalia's talk and i am tempted tempted to quote uh, mr shashi tharur here in his oxford union speech where he says that i feel like the eighth wife of king henry the eighth i know what is expected of me i just don't know how to do it differently but ladies and gentlemen i will be talking today of taylor neck fractures this is a very straightforward topic mind you this is not really a hatke topic but it's nonetheless an important talk topic and i will be telling you how to get these fractures right so we will be looking very quickly at the pertinent anatomy and the classification of these fractures and the patho mechanisms most of us know this but i will be touching this for the benefit of the post graduate students here and then we will be delving into the management as well as the outcomes and complications so as we know talus is the second largest tarsal bone no surprises there it has three important articulations and most of it is covered by articular cartilage you know about the blood supply but for the post graduates the deltoid branch of the posterior tibial artery is so important and it may be the only branch remaining in case of a displaced taylor neck fracture so whenever you go in and operate these fractures make sure you are not damaging the deltoid ligament so we know about the classification of these fractures but to touch it very quickly what is a talus neck fracture now again for the post graduate students on the lateral view you see the lateral process of talus and any fracture line anterior to the lateral process of the uh, talus is a talus neck fracture whereas if it is at the lateral process or posterior to it this is classified as a talus body fracture you know about the hawkins classification but some of you may know that dr hawkins was actually a very passionate hand surgeon but then he gave us this very very important hawkins classification which was modified by canale and kelly so we know type 1 are undisplaced fractures type 2 are displaced fractures but then valier and et al came up with this paper where they showed 
that in a type 2 fracture if the subtalar joint is you know only subluxed or not dislocated the avian rates are close to 0% whereas if you have a hawkins type 2 with a frank subtalar joint dislocation mind you not subluxation the avian rates go up to 25% so this is new we have 2a and 2b type 3 you know when the you know talus is dislocated from the mortis and of course the fourth variant where you have dislocation from the talonavicular joint this was added by canale and kelly so we know that talus neck fractures occur because of high velocity trauma and the classical mechanism was described by coltart where you have you know a forced dorsiflexion the talus neck impinges against the anterior plafond and breaks off now this is known as an aviator's fracture classically but this can also occur commonly due to an inversion mechanism where you have a compression force acting medially that's why you have medial comminution and tensile force acting laterally so now coming on to the main part of this talk which is how to get these talus fractures right so workup includes all your standard views as well as a ct scan for the postgraduate students again this is how you do a canale view and it beautifully demonstrates the neck profile of the talus a ct scan helps you delineate the fracture anatomy it shows you under surface comminution this is a high risk indicator for you know post operative subtalar arthrosis and in some cases like you can see here you may also pick up talonavicular joint subluxations which may not be so obvious on plain radiographs now when do you do surgery for these cases so earlier it was thought the earlier you operate lesser the avian but it has been shown that it is important to reduce dislocations acutely but early surgical intervention like operative fixation really does not decrease the risk of avian or post traumatic arthrosis however if you have a talar neck fracture with dislocation you want to reduce this now look here this is a type 3 fracture where the body is lying against the posterior medial skin and in this position it can not only cause pressure necrosis but there are important neurovascular structures there you have the posterior tibial artery the you know the, the tibial nerve so you don't want any neurovascular compromise so you have to go in early close reduction if possible yes many times this does not happen then you have to go in and do an emergent open reduction so as you know surgical approaches dual approaches are the standard of care in 2021 you do not want to be doing a single approach you know this because dual approaches give you better assessment of varus as well as rotation and anterior medial anterior lateral approaches are the standard of care so the anterior medial approach is a straight forward approach it runs from the tip of medial malleolus to the first ray the only important structure here is saphenous vein of course also the deltoid ligament as i uh, told you you split the medial capsule and you're bang on to the medial talar neck and very very important again i'm telling you please protect the deltoid which may be the only remaining blood supply the anterior lateral approach is also pretty much straight forward you go from the tip of fibula to the fourth metatarsal base you can split the extensor digitorum brevis or even you know work around it under it and raise it in a dorsal direction this gives you a good access to the subtalar joint as you can see here and good access to the anterior lateral part of the talar neck and the talar body now principles of fixation so as i told you many of these injuries are inversion injuries so the tensile side is lateral you can use compression screws here the comminuted side is the medial side so you have to use positional screws or plates or k wires here so you can also plate uh, you know in recent times there has been a trend to use plating on the lateral side in this position it acts on the principle of a tension band plate and if you put a plate on the medial side this works on the principles of bridge plating so now taking you some of the cases so this is a hawkins type one fracture with a medial malleolus fracture now mind you i have not shown the ct scan here but the ct showed that this was a completely undisplaced fracture and many times fractures that do not show displacement on radiographs will show rotation and other types of displacements on ct scans however if you have a case like this you can go in for a percutaneous fixation you can put in one screw from the medial side and another from the lateral side this allows early range of motion and early toe touch weight bearing so this is a hawkins type 2a you can see that there is a displaced talar neck fracture but the subtalar joint is more or less okay 
and this is non comminuted so you do a dual approach and because there was no comminution you can use compression screws on both the sides now this is a hawkins type 2b fracture with a subtalar dislocation and you can see that this is an impressive sort of deformity but when this patient came to us we were able to do a closed reduction straight away and how do you do this so you plantar flex the ankle and flex the knee this relaxes the gastrocnemius tendo achilles complex you give a traction and increase the deformity to unlock this thing and then you gradually reverse the deformity and in this case we were able to get a good reduction the ct scan also shows that there is no residual displacement and then this was followed up by percutaneous fixation so another case this is a hawkins type 2b with comminution and as you can see here there is comminution on both the medial as well as the lateral sides and this is really the 3d pathoanatomy of this case so as you can see on the medial side there is that typical comminution you can see that the subtalar joint is out it is dislocated coming on to the lateral side you will be able to appreciate that the lateral process is fractured and of course there is also lateral comminution so this is just to show you that there are all varieties of talus fractures you just don't have the garden varieties of the medial comminution and the lateral intact and you have to tailor the treatment to the case so what did we do in this case so of course the first and the most important step is to get the subtalar reduction so we did a lateral approach figured out where the subtalar joint was put in a periosteal elevator very gently and increased the deformity and then brought the subtalar joint back and you can see here that this has been reduced it was unstable so we pinned this with two k wires <clears throat> temporarily and you can see that even as we did this the talus neck is starting to fall back into place there is a semblance of restoration of anatomy so because the lateral side was comminuted and you can see here this is the lateral process of talus we used a jest distractor you know putting pins in the fibula as well as in the navicular and brought out the lateral side to length provisionally fixed the lateral process with k wires also the medial side all provisional fixation with k wires fixed the lateral process with some screws and put a bridge plate on the lateral side so mind you because this is comminution this was a bridge plating on the lateral side then we went on to the medial side which again was comminuted now because this patient was poor i really did not have uh, access to some of the good uh, you know synthesis implants where you have mini fragment plates so i decided to put positional screws on the medial side which serve the same purpose as plates so you can see at 6 months follow up this has healed well there is no avascular necrosis however this patient is starting to get early subtalar arthrosis and we will be following this up so this is another case where there was comminution on the medial side and we have used a you know a wedge a small wedge graft from the iliac crest along with a bridge plating on the medial side so here is an important handy surgical tip you can use a k wire inserted into the tailor head and use it as a joystick to get your reduction so for a frontal plane reduction you can play around with this wire till you get reduction this is especially important if you are planning to put in wedge grafts on the medial side and you can also correct rotation of the tailor head by rotating the wire so here is a hawkins type 3 fracture and this case is actually taken from the ao archives to show you what all tricks we can use so in this case a femoral distractor has been used to create space in the ankle mortis and k wires have been used to lever the uh, the displaced body back into the ankle mortis and this is the post operative however this is one of our own cases so this is a 62 year old male he was a smoker and he comes in like this with an open type 3 uh, not a type 3 uh, open fracture but a hawkins type 3 talus uh, you know uh, neck fracture and the talus body you can see is almost out so looking at the pathoanatomy now the 3d reconstruction mind you comes from a different case but it illustrates the pathoanatomy so you can see that there is a dislocation of the talus body it is in this case it is lying posterior medially which is so common like i have told you and there is extensive comminution of the medial side often you will find that there is comminution of the lateral side as well and if you see very carefully there is often subluxation of the talonavicular joint which you need to address 
so this is these are the intraoperative pictures now in this case as soon as we did the debridement we found that the talus body was completely free the dome cartilage was, was more or less in you know intact as, except for a small sort of uh, a, a, you know a, a cut here perhaps and then there was extensive undersurface comminution so this gets me thinking the subtalar joint cartilage is already gone he is a smoker so in this case i decided to put back the talar body nonetheless and this was done by using a, a you know a pin through the the calcaneus you know creating some space and then putting in the talar body with the help of a joystick but in this case because there was extensive subtalar comminution the the articular uh, this thing of the talus was uh, severely comminuted so i prepared the subtalar joint and did a primary subtalar fusion now mind you it has been shown that when this fusion is successful this will bring black uh, bring the blood supply from the calcaneus into the talus and perhaps this can salvage this case now the medial side was comminuted so i put in a small graft here and put a bridge plate and then completed the fixation on the lateral side with screw and k wire so at 3 months follow up you can see that there was no hawkins sign but again there was no frank avascular necrosis as well the fracture is healing this is 6 months you can appreciate small lucency of course there is no again no established avascular necrosis but now a problem the medial side is probably not uniting and i will be taking him up for grafting uh, for bone grafting or perhaps for a bmac injection so just to show you one of my difficult cases so how to manage these cases in the post operative case now we usually give a bivalve cast till suture removal and this is to prevent any equinus deformity in the post operative period if the patient can afford we give this brace which is known as a patent bottom brace so it essentially allows the weight transfer from the foot to directly to the patella and it offloads the talus so the patient can fully weight bear in this kind of a brace or you can allow him to touch weight bearing in a cast but you don't want to allow them full weight bearing till you have seen no evidence of avian and complete union so let's look at the outcomes and complications here so the best outcomes for these fractures are for type 1s and 2s which do not have complications in the post operative period classically avn you know the overall rate is 49% and type 3s and 4 hawkins are associated with 70 to almost 100% rates of avn and this was again one of the thoughts in my mind when i showed you that case of type 3 so we wanted to prevent avn why not do a primary fusion in that case now hawkins sign for the post graduates a quick revision this is a subchondral lucency that you see at 6 to 8 weeks and a positive sign shows you know that the talus is revascularizing and it has low chances of avascular necrosis now mind you even if avascular necrosis happens it may not be a bad outcome in all cases and valier et al have shown in their series of 39 cases avian happened in 50% almost but even in those 37% of the cases revascularized without any secondary intervention so gentlemen again very important even if you have an avian you put the patient on partial weight bearing wait and watch and many of these cases will revascularize even if they collapse if the central part or the the central dome doesn't collapse the patient may not have really a very bad outcome the other important complication which is very common like i have showed you in one of my cases is subtalar arthrosis malunion is up to 17% and this usually comes from lack of experience and lack of understanding of the fracture patterns nonunion is seen in smokers and high risk diabetic patients and infection although rare is more commonly seen in open fractures so the take home points from this presentation is that you need to reduce these fractures accurately in 2021 there is no role of a single approach if you are going to operate them if you are going to do an open reduction please used combined approaches anterior medial and anterior lateral the deltoid blood supply is vital for these fractures avoid varus do not compress the comminuted medial side use bridge plates k wires or screws very important osteonecrosis always does not equate to a poor result sometimes nature does the work and healing will happen and subtalar arthrosis is a common complication so thank you 
Thank you, Dr. Star, for a nice talk. Now we finish with this session, and now I invite Dr. Rashid to conduct the other session. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Anup, for a wonderful, uh, smooth conduct of the lecture. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Altaf Kausa, sir, to present his talk on uh, arthrodiseases. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. This is Altaf from Srinagar. So tonight I will be presenting few uh, cases on arthrodiseases. I'm sharing my screen. So this is a brief case-based presentation regarding orthodiastasis. You know, orthodiastasis is dysfunction around the joints. You know, a wonderful technique to overcome deformities around joints. Based on the principle of gradual distraction, and it can be performed on any joint. So why should one opt for orthodiastasis? So you have cases like this with severe contractures, post-trauma, skin grafted, but very difficult to manage. Then again, road traffic accident with equinus and scar around. Again, a scar. And then there could be due to other methods, due to other consequences, like this guy who had a limb lengthening and then resulted in an equinus contracture bilaterally. So how to perform this technique? We use the rings across the joint, which should be stable and strong. That would withstand the stresses of distraction and use a differential distraction to prevent joint damage or use hinges in the lengthening mode. I'll try to explain this. By this example, you see, this is a 50 years old patient with a history of road traffic accident, he had a head injury associated, and after recovering in ICU, presented with FFD in the knee at 90 degrees. So there was some kind of a pellegrin stereotype. So this is an endon flexed AP. Then this is the application of the orthodiastasis with the laser or technique. You have enough rings on both sides to maximize the leverage. You use a proximal ring as the proximal tibia and then one above the ankle. And then you use above the knee joint and another one at the subtracantic area. Essential is the placement of these hinges. So you have a posterior motor unit where you would be distracting and while as this is anterior to the joint line, so this would create a simultaneous lengthening as well as deformity correction. Crush the cartridge. So this is how it was achieved. Now you can see the joint space has increased and you have absolutely corrected deflection deformity. Again, this is post-road traffic accident, a D-glove injury. The plastic surgeons did their job, created some kind of a coverage, but left the foot deformed. So there is equinus as well as varus. And then, you know, everybody would agree that putting in a scalpel would be really something very disturbing and wouldn't achieve anything. So that's why we resort to these external methods. Again, here we applied just distractor and after distraction, we were able to achieve a plantar grip foot. And this is a very interesting case. This six years old child with history of open fracture tibia and associated a deagle of injury was treated by plastic surgeons. But again, he has a huge scar tissue and you have a lot of scar tissue and this, the, there is hardly any movement in the joint. And the joint is fixed at more than 110, 120 degrees. So this was really a challenge to manage. So what are the problems? Problems are you have a fragile skin, you have skin contractures, and cordyceps is really thinned out. 
So if we look at the gait pattern, so the child has been really disturbed by this kind of a gait. This is almost crawling rather than walking. This is quite distressing to the patient as well as his parents. So, what do, how to go about this? You know, again, this is the picture showing the scar tissue, thinned out scar tissue, and he has a proximo, he has a big scar posteriorly. Then you got to plan. So we applied a ring above the ankle and another at the proximal tibia, then above femur, and this is the arch above at the subtrachantric level. So why I would include this much of length is to resist the stresses that are generation generated during distraction. And that's why you use shan screws in between as well. Again, these are at the joint lines. In case you don't put the hinges anterior, then you got to do a differential distraction. Why differential distraction? You see, everybody would agree that if you're gonna move this knee here, then if not lengthen simultaneously, it will crush the cartilage. So the idea would be that it should get lengthened as well as corrected. So this would be the next stage. And finally, this would be the final stage. So you have created at the same time the joint space as well as you have created the correction. So how we went about this? Again, this is the construct and this is the posterior motor unit where you're gonna turn. And this is after you have straightened it, you have corrected it. Then once you correct it, you got to maintain it. So this is the lovely post-op. So my initial, my initial, this was to keep it, whether I would be only getting, uh, sorry, my initial concern was to get a straighter limb so that the patient is ambulatory. And I would expect any kind of a motion as a bonus. So, so he was able to flex up to the 90 degree A1. And a nice result. Similarly, I have another child, seven years old, again, road traffic accident and had a simultaneous traumatic arrest of the distal tibia. Here we again applied just and at the same time did physiodesis. The talus here is almost 180 degrees. And this is posterior differential restriction in, uh, within the just fixator. We were able to get a plant degree foot. And what about sometimes you have post lengthening? This is very common in tibia lengthenings. This was 23 years old student who had stretch lengthening somewhere else, presented to us with bilateral equine contracture. This was his gait, may not play. Not playing. So again, we went ahead with the orthodiastasis method a stronger posterior pin to counter the stresses. More ring there could real, I realized later because the forces generated would even bend it. But somehow I was able to manage it. This is the radiograph for distraction. Sim uh, similarly, we applied in the right side. He had some valgus deformity also. This is correction achieved within the ring. And final correction, though we have some valgus on the right side persisting. And what about using in these things? It's again an interesting thing. 16 year old girl with a history of road traffic accident, healed with a contracting scar and subluxation at the second metatarsopharyngeal joint. Again, this is a bad area to put in a scalpel on. Patient had difficulty in the shoe wear. Then we used the 
more distractor, UMAX, UMAX distractor. And we were able to get it into this position. The scar is relaxed. This is one of the cases of my consultant. So what's the conclusion? This is very effective technique. Needs a medical planning and follow-up is very essential. Then strict follow-up in brace after correction. You might need to have night bracing for quite some time till you are comfortable that the correction is maintained. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Altaf, sir, rightly so known as the magician. Now for the next talk, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Samarth Mittal to present on one of the common and very interesting talk that tips and tricks in the nailing of ITM sub talk fractures. So over to you, Dr. Samarth. Thank you. I kindly request Dr. Altaf to stop sharing his screen so that I can share mine. Oh, yeah, thank you. Sorry. I thank the Jammu, Jammu Trauma Society for inviting me for this talk and uh, I especially thank Dr. Gupta and Dr. Gani for inviting me here. Uh, over the next few minutes, I would be talking to you about uh, intertrochantric and subtrochantric fractures, some tips and tricks in how to deal with these fractures. So I am an assistant professor working at Trauma Center Ames, New Delhi. So by the end of the next 10 minutes or so, I would be talking about how to avoid flexion, how to avoid varus and how to use some instruments such as uh, Homan's retractor, the collinear reduction clamp, or a ball spike pusher to reduce these fractures. So there are a lot of classification systems when it comes to the intertrochantric fractures, and um, all of them have some importance or the other, but the main point from most of these classification systems is to understand what are the uh, stable fracture types and what are the unstable fracture types. It is important to note that the new AO classification has now changed and has a special uh, uh, place for fractures with uh, incompetent lateral wall. These are fractures. We don't have a fractured lateral wall, but just have a thin lateral wall, which is less than 20.5 millimeters. And they consider all these fractures as unstable fractures because the lateral wall is liable to get fractured if you put a DHS. So one thing we need to know is all unstable fracture patterns, the best uh, way to treat them is to use a uh, nail instead of a screw. So uh, this is one paper published in 2009 in the uh, JBJS, uh, which, which was an instruction course lecture from American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons by Dr. Haidukovic, which is a very good read. It gives 10 simple tips and uh, tips to avoid malreduction in intertrochantric fractures. And I would advise everyone to go through this paper if they find time. So uh, there are fractures which look very stable, but these are irreducible fracture, and we should know the irreducible fracture types, especially these fractures where the lesser trochanter is broken into the middle, into two halves. The proximal fragment has a half of the LT and the other half has the other half of the lesser trochanter. So these fracture patterns, they have either a reverse three or an epsilon kind of a appearance on the X-ray or the normal three kind of a, a, a figure which is either left sided or right sided and the, they become irreducible because the it is because of the uh, pull of the iliopsoas tendon on the pa part of the lesser trochanter attached to the distal fragment which gets into the way and avoids reduction and this epsilon sign was described by dr chandak in 2019 itself he, uh, in the european journal of orthopedic trauma surgery wherein they described that these are fractures that need an open reduction they are they look stable, they look easy, but they are very difficult to reduce and they are best reduced uh, uh, open. However, we had published a similar paper from, from Trauma Center Ames into the, back in 2014 in injury, wherein we had uh, recognized this fracture type. Obviously, we did not give it a very fancy name of epsilon type, which has now become very popular, but we had described a similar fracture type here where the iliopsoas tendon gets attached and gets into the way. And we had also described the same thing that how to uh, pull the iliopsoas tendon out or take a homan, blunt homan, and use it to pull off the uh, psoas tendon and get a good reduction. And then once they're reduced, they can either be fixed with a nail or a uh, plate, whatever is the surgeon preference. In the same paper, we have described a lot of other fracture types. And uh, in this, we have described this extension type of a fracture wherein they become very difficult to reduce. And one can use a shan spin from the anterior cortex, pull up the proximal fragment up. Once it gets into the way, then can be reduced and then fixed with either a nail or a DHS. Similarly, there are these fracture types where there is a small or a large posteromedial fragment which gets into the way of uh, proximal fragment and distal fragment. And it is these fractures where unless you reduce, take out this posteromedial fragment, the fra reduction cannot be achieved. Once the reduction is achieved, it can be fixed. 
and there are these fracture types wherein the iliopsoas can get attached or some fragment can get in the way wherein you want need to go in and take a bone holding clamp and get the uh, proximal fragment reduced with the distal fragment uh, so all in all we need to understand what are the unstable fracture types and once you get reduction in these fractures the a uh, good thing to do is to nail these fractures because they are more stable when they are fixed with uh, nails rather than uh, dhs so the unstable fracture patterns are the ones with the posterior medial comminution the ones that have lateral cortex thickness of less than 20.5 mm which already have a lateral cortex blow out or a comminution or they have a coronal split of the lateral cortex or when the gt is a separate fragment or the stable looking fractures in a very osteoporotic bone where you feel the dhs is going to pull out or during reaming with a triple reamer in the dhs you are going to fracture the lateral wall these are patients where you need to nail so and once you know the tips and tricks no matter how difficult the fracture looks like in this case top left you see a very difficult fracture this has four or five fragments but if you take them on a fracture table bring out to length they may look in some varus put in a guide wire and this is one tip that i use uh, uh, personally use so i use a ball spike pusher or a picador to push the fragment i go just medial to from the same incision side i take this picador and pull on the push on the proximal fragment push the fragment from varus to valgus once that is done they can be fixed in good ap and lateral view the screw or the blade needs to go center center and you will have a good reduction so very bad looking fractures can be made very good looking this is a common deformity that we get flexion deformity and a lot of techniques have been described for this but i what i do in my general practice is i just make the entry point while making the entry point from the incision of the entry point i put in a homan and just pointed towards the roof and that corrects the flexion external rotation as well as varus all three deformities are corrected by a single homan put in through the same incision and once that is done you can fix the fracture with either a nail or a screw this is a fracture in a 79 year old male which is a very osteoporotic bone and it is a extension type of a fracture which we saw on the ct scan nevertheless we go, went ahead and got a very good fixation however the and the patient was mobilized full weight bearing because i believe in strongly believe in believe in full weight bearing in these patients any form of mobilization after 65 years of age in a fracture has to be complete uh, uh, mobilization full weight bearing anything less than that is just not possible in this age group and this patient unfortunately had another fall one month following the fixation of the first fracture and this is the time when the uh, concept that one should know is what screws what are the other options that are available so this was a uh, fracture was initially fixed one of with one of the most advanced nails in the market which is the TFNA from Synthes but then that has a lag screw of 10.25 or 10.5 mm diameter in the head with this there to revise this nail with something getting a good hold into the neck and you want to hold the neck at the same point of time because the old intertrochanteric fracture is just one month old and is not fully united this is the time when i use something available in the market with a uh, coupled lag screw which has a diameter of 15.75 or 15.5 mm so we should always know the other options available in the market and this is what we used in this patient and then he was again fully weight bear uh, mobilized with full weight bearing after this fixation this is another fracture type which is very less described in literature this is the extension type of a it fracture wherein all i do is i just put a make the entry point use the entry point i put a homan through the entry point and lift the proximal fragment up once that is done the once the reduction is achieved one can do a simple nailing or a dhs whatever one prefers and this is another technique that i use so i don't fiddle around whenever i'm uh, putting the guide wire in the lateral view what i do is instead of putting my uh, guide wires in the ap view i just Uh, uh, eyeball my guide wire in the AP view, and then I shift to a lateral view. Once I shift to a lateral view, what I see is I project the image of the jig onto the head into the lateral view, and once I see it as center, center, that is the time I shoot my wire in the lateral view. And more often than not, I get my lateral view, the wire in the center of the head, in one going uh, uh, these patients. Otherwise, what happens in very osteoporotic bone, elderly patients, you try to correct the rotation and get the wire into uh, other areas of the head, either in the anterior or the posterior part. but that doesn't happen because of radial wire because it tends to follow the same path so the best time to get a wire in the center and the lateral view is the first bone and this is the te technique that i used to do that uh, then there are some challenging situations wherein you can get these subtrochanteric fractures in polyotic bones i have a large series of these patients and more, most of the time i try to do a nail in these patients because uh, these patients have poor muscle mass they have poor blood flow and they have regional osteoporosis the chances of union in these fractures takes longer time so i want to keep a implant that gives me a longer time to failure or gives me more time for union but the problems here are the diameter of the canal is less and there is a normal going of the femur so whenever you are going for these patients you go in for too many options not just one option so i went in got a good reduction put in a guide wire dream the uh, nail but then when i put the nail in 
because of the curvature of the femur it was too bored and when i put the nail in even though i had reduced the fracture and the wire was put in reduction but the nail was distracting the fracture and hence i had to go to a plan b so always be ready in this difficult situations with a plan b i took the distal femur plate of the opposite side did a lag and lock and got a good reduction in this patient this is a six month follow up and then one year follow up of this patient and he did really well uh this is uh, one of the cases that it i just a month back but this is one fracture where i used two or three reduction maneuvers this looks like a very bad fracture it has four pieces uh, lt is separate gt has two uh, fragments the proximal and the distal fragment is different so this is where first what i did is like i always do try to make the entry point put in a homan from that side and first thing i did is in the lateral view i corrected the flexion deformity so my lateral view started looking good but when i went to the ap view the shaft and the proximal part were still separated from each other and this is the time that i brought in the collinear reduction clamp with the collinear reduction clamp i brought the fracture in place and once the fracture was good in ap and lateral view this is the clinical picture there and then i started uh, reaming for the nail once the nail was put in i felt that the uh, neck was in slight varus which was apparent from the neck guide wire and this is the time when i used the second technique that i have already described by putting a ball spike pusher or the uh, tightener of the nail itself and push the proximal fragment into slight valgus once that was done i pushed my guide wire in and the guide wire went in the right position and then what i did is once the even though it had a lot, small amount of distraction what i did is once i put the screw in and that is the time when you compress the nail on these lag screw devices uh, you can see in the picture down on the third picture in the bottom there and once you get a good reduction there good compression that is all the incision that is required to do such a big job and you get a very good looking x ray on the table and this is the post operative x ray which does not really tell you the story which went into the operation theater one fracture required two or three reduction techniques even though the whole time of surgery was less than half an hour for this patient but then you can you need to improvise yourself and you may need to use more than one technique for these patients coming to a very difficult patient this is more than a 90 year old patient had a bipolar of the opposite side fractured this side she had a recent uh, mi and my anesthetist would just not allow me to do a bipolar in this patient so even though the fracture looked bad i had no other option i wanted to mobilize the patient so i went in for a nail this is how it looked on the fracture table looked very bad to me but then i followed the principles what it is is uh, looked at the flexion in the lateral view pulled out the shaft laterally brought the shaft to alignment looked at the lateral view put the uh, anterior homan from the same fracture site brought the calcar into its position connected the flexion of the proximal fragment which started look look better on the lateral view there was no flexion left now and then on the ap view i made the guide wire uh, put the guide wire in with reduction put the nail in once i put the nail in the guide wire went into the neck and the head in uh, no varus and no valgus and that is the lateral view and then this is uh, how the i put in a blade and this is how the final x rays of the patient look so we started from there and we ended up there so even in very bad looking fractures it is easy to get good reduction and good fixation and you can mobilize these patients the very next day because uh, uh, if you follow the principles right if the reduction is good there is no varus there is no flexion and your reduction is stable then you should not be afraid of mobilizing your patients i have a few more tri tricks so this is a old fracture one month old fracture even with a lot of traction the flexion the varus would just not correct so here i need to make in a more medial entry so to make a more more medial entry there i put in a guide wire but then whenever you ream you ream mostly lateral to the guide wire so what i do is use a sh very sharp ball spike pusher or a very small medial wall cutter i use that cutter to get a good medial entry point once that entry point is made i put my nail in through the fracture side but i know i have not done wedge effect because i've uh, gone in and uh, reamed very medially and then again i used that uh, technique of pushing the medial frag uh, proximal fragment distally brought the uh, varus into valgus and then i fixed this fracture other case where i used instead of a ball spike pusher or a tightener i have used a homans to push on uh, medially onto the proximal fragment another case where there was almost no lateral wall i have put the guide wire in and just to ream medial to that i have used a medial wall cutter another case uh, this is a revision case where someone had operated this case outside in and aims with a pfn and this had failed so i did a revision and i wanted to made a make a medial entry and this is a channel reamer this is a new reamer which has come up in the market in the last two or three years it, it's available only with uh, the top two uh, one of the top two uh, suppliers and this reamer uh, drills only in the center it doesn't drill eccentrically to the lateral side and that is how i made, got a good entry 
you even if you don't have that reamer if you want to uh, uh, correct your entry there are another techniques which i have learned from the master techniques they have explained the use of a plate on the lateral wall but what i do is i put a large cobs on the lateral wall because i don't want to waste a plate and then you can put a reamer so that you don't ream anything laterally you ream all, uh, everything medially and once you put the nail in even if your proximal fragment is in varus all you need to do is push the uh, proximal fragment and get the valgus corrected and then you can get good looking x rays even in these patients another case where i have used a collinear reduction get clamp to get the reduction right when the fracture is distracted and these are patients uh, yeah, very young males sometimes they are more than 60 uh, kg of weight they are very healthy and they are adult looking adolescent patients wherein most of us think of only putting a titanium elastic nail system wherein uh, i go in and put in something called as the adolescent nail this is also available in the market these are nails with smaller diameter and they have a very large bend at the top because they go to avoid uh, damage to the blood supply they go very lateral and they go through the center of the gt and these patients can then be mobilized very soon otherwise if you do a tens in these patients it becomes very unstable and then you tend to put them in a boot and bar or something uh, and they the mobilization these patients becomes very difficult. another fracture like i uh, explained this is a epsilon looking fracture all one needs to do is put in two homans get the reduction right once that is done this can be done closed or with a dhs screw and this is another patient in a polyotic uh, limb where i found the canal to be too thin but then i always try to do a nail even in this polyotic patients because the blood flow is low i don't blood supply is low i don't want to strip more of most of the muscle and cause the necrosis of the bone so got a good reduction on the fracture table but once i tried to put the reamers in and the reamers would not go in so what i did is i took hand reamers you can see i'm literally creating a canal here with my reamer there so i've created a canal then put in the reamer then put in the next side of the nail so starting here when i did not have any canal and by the end i created a canal and then i put the lowest side of the nail which was a nine nail in 32 mm long and the proximal part i fixed with the blade because this was the smallest possible thing possible this is a 70 mm blade there is nothing smaller available than this but then i got a good reduction in both ap and lateral views and this uh, fracture went on to heal well and the patient is really happy so the take home message is a stable looking fracture could behave in a very unstable manner so always look out for signs of irreducibility whenever you go in to fix intertrochanteric fractures do not think that all intertrochanteric and subtrochanteric fractures will uh, reduce for themselves when you take them on the fracture table do not hesitate to get a ct scan if you feel there is something wrong with the fracture or if you see the fracture pattern is a little odd avoid using pfn or intramedullary nail as a reduction device even though it can be used as a reduction device but it, it is best to be kept in the uh, hands of experts keep threshold for open reduction very low and uh, whenever you are struggling remember that a well uh, reduced near anatomical reduced fracture gives much better result as compared to mal reduced stable fixation even if it is done percutaneously and at all cost no matter what you do if there is one take home message that i want to bring from my talk is to avoid varus and flexion in trochanteric and subtrochanteric fracture at any cost thank you so much for it thank you dr samad for a wonderful talk uh, next i would like to invite uh, professor abdul ghani sir for his talk on intertrochanteric fractures is dhs still an option so over to you sir
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Other panelists, can you can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. So good evening. Further to previous talk, obviously rightly times after nailing, it is time for DHS. So first of all, why do we need to discuss this, whether DHS or nailing? Because of late, there is a trend that everybody is shifting towards nailing, actually. So is there still any role of DHS? That's a debate, actually. I am slightly more towards DHS. And when we talk of uh, fracture, essentially, we are talking on this interdocular fracture in this area we are talking of, actually. When we talk of fracture, essentially, we have to classify whether it is a stable fracture or unstable fracture. So when it is stable and unstable, when it is lateral wall is intact and lesser trochanter is intact, that means it's stable and can be treated by any method. But when it is lesser trochanter is off and lateral wall is not intact, this is called an unstable fracture. And again, there's a question whether we need a DHS here or we can treat it with a nail. So we have got variety of implant, but main debate is between the nail and DHS. So essentially, what are the goals of treatment? The goals of treatment are adequate and stable reduction. It is, the, the fixation has to be mechanically adequate, adequate, and it should permit early weight bearing. It should permit early weight bearing. Uh, the prerequisite for reduction is, one has to be the correct indication for correct implant. The quality reduction, of course, whether you have to do an open reduction, feel free to do that. Medical is technique. And of course, one must preserve the biology as much as possible. When you talk of correct indication, you're talking of, I'm talking here only at the DHS. And my indication for DHS is the lateral wall should be intact. When we talk of Evans classification, type one, two, and four can safely be treated by DHS, whereas type three, where the lateral wall is, wall is broken, when one should avoid DHS. When we talk of other classification, Biden Griffith, type one and two safely treated by DHS, whereas type three, four, where the lateral cortex is not intact, lateral wall, so one should opt for DHS. AO, OTA classification, A1 and A2, safely can be treated by DHS, and A3 should not be treated by DHS. Essentially, and that is supported by the literature as well. The integrity of the lateral wall is a predictor of failure. If, uh, for example, if the lateral wall is not in intact, that can lead to failure. For example, these are the X-ray, these are the classical cases for DHS, straightforward, no issues with that. Again, the lateral wall is intact, DHS, though it looks unstable, but DHS, again, for DHS for this, DHS for this, what are the other indication for DHS? I also we need to mention because we need to know basic cervical fracture, DHS, at time intercapsular neck, neck of femur fracture, DHS with valgus astatomy. At time, rarely in case of subclock fracture, though the ideal treatment is nailing, but when there is a good amount of at least one centimeter intact distal to the entry, you can easily use DHS in that situation, not necessarily DCS. So what are the contraindications? When there's a lateral wall which is broken, it is a contraindication. It is again, the lateral wall is broken, it is a contraindication. Lateral wall broken, so it is a contraindication. These are, if you see this fracture on the one side, safely can be treated by DHS. On the other side, however, it is lateral wall is broken, so one should go for nailing. To do a better DHS, you need to have some tips and tricks. And obviously, the pre -op, it starts with the pre-op planning. One has to be adequate pre-op X-ray, which means AP pelvis, not one hip. And of course, the lateral view is important. And one must ask for traction and internal rotation view because that's going to exactly tell you the geometry of the fracture. 
for example, this fracture looks completely different fracture when you do a proper X-ray. Uh, X-ray on the other side is entirely different. X-ray of pelvis with bilateral hip, because at times there's a coxa velga. So you need to have a proper angle. And you need to restore the same angle on the opposite side. And you need to ask for the X-ray of the opposite side. And with a patient with a suspected pathological fracture, ask for an X-ray of the whole leg, whole femur. And ideally, the target of these elderly patients should be to operate within 48 hours. And of course, after optimization. Then you go to the theater, start the reduction, of course, on the fracture table. The reduction is generally stated for traction, slight abduction, and internal rotation. At times, you have to increase the external rotation to disimpact or unlock the fracture and pull it distally and then rotate it back. And one must assess the reduction for fracture displacement, neck shaft angle, antiversion, femoral shaft sag, or any rotation clinically. Only gentle traction, however, and not a forceful traction because forceful traction can easily lead to subtrochanter conversion. And the quality reduction is the prerequisite. It can be closed, and if there is any issue, go for open reduction, but it has to be anatomical reduction before you proceed. So do not proceed unless until you get a adequate reduction. At times, you may have to use a clamp, as Dr. Mittal already suggested, but you need to be careful again because these are protein bones and you can easily cause more damage and also the neurovascular structure, you have to be careful about. The next would be the guide wire insertion. Try to use guide wire, uh, guide, angle guide always. You cut variable angle as well as one of six angle. Try preferably using variable angle. That is going to give more leverage. And you always start at the superior part of the lesser trochanter. However, if you have to use a higher angle, you can have to shift five millimeter distal with each five degree increase in angle. And of course, Another tip is don't try to push the angle guide completely against the lateral surface. At, you have to keep it slightly off. Otherwise, your wire is going to go quite superior and you may end up in malreduction actually. So guide wire has to be center center. Uh, ensure that at least one centimeter intact lateral wall below the last two entry in case if really you have to use DHS in case of subtrochanter fracture. Ensure guide wire in a proper neck shaft angle, center center in the both views like this. Of course, the next is, there's a controversial actually, and I do slightly different, the book recommends, for example, you measure the length from the subcontrol area 1.105, so you're going to minus 10, which is 95, your ramer length, your screw length, everything is going to be 95. But what I do is, for example, I measure 95, I would take the triple ramer to 105. I do it reverse, because I don't want to Reamer, ream it uh, with the triple reamer. I just use double reamer, and you have to increase the length of the uh, triple reamer. So also you need to know that the triple reamer comes in the short barrel and long barrel as well, depend upon the adequacy. So you only use the double reamer, utmost attempt to avoid lateral wall shattering. That is the trick, actually, the real tip you want to take away, because if you're going to use triple reamer, you are essentially, you can easily cause the fracture of the lateral wall and that will defeat the purpose. So you have to preserve the lateral wall as much as possible. So again, try to use this. Tip apex distance is of course very important. You are already aware of that, both views, combination of the distance. It should be between 15 to 25. Anything beyond un under 25, the failure can approach almost zero. But over 25, the, the chances of failure is going to be increasing rapidly. So this is what the X, it should be looking on the both AP and lateral both the tip apex distance as well as center center. Other important aspect is, of course, the appropriate size of the lag screw. It should not be too long, it should not be too short. It should be just in the subcondral region. Avoid rotation of the head neck fragment while inserting, that's very important as well. You need to be aware of the barrel length. It comes in, standard length is 38 millimeters. The angle standard is 135, but it has also got short barrel as well. You need to be aware of, because the reason for that is, it is going to provide the dynamic collapse and you need to be aware of when to use short barrel and when, when not to use short uh, when, the long barrel. If you're using, if the, the screw length is 85, then you are going to be using short barrel. The reason for that is because the thread length is 22, recommended sliding is 28, 25, and the standard barrel length is 38. If you combine all of them, it is 85. And that is the reason you are going to use short barrel plate. Avoid forceful seating of the plate. It should just slide smoothly. Try to insert the second last screw, the first, otherwise the screw, 
the plate is going to off the cortex, uh, the shaft, and then of course the proximal screw. It should be just sliding like this. It should not be forceful sitting. And this, whether you should be using compression screw or not, normally, if at all it you are using, you have to remove it because the intraoperatory is going to give compression. And after that, it is not going to give any compression. But in case of very unstable fracture, perhaps better to keep it. Otherwise, there is going to be disengagement of the screw from the barrel. And at times you may have to use the DHS in case of neck femur fracture intracapsular. So you're going to use a shorter plate with a derotation screw. At times you may have to use a TSP along with that. There is a there's a lateral wall broken or there is a portrochanter fracture. So in summary, pre-op proper X-ray, per op only gentle and controlled reduction. Quality reduction, of course, avoid any virus and sagging. Don't proceed unless adequate reduction, which may be open. Center center placement of the screw. Tip apex distance, very important. Of course, everything is not rosy rosy. There can be complication as well, like screw cutout, screw barrel disengagement. Like this is one of the example. Another example, another breakage of the implant. Like this, the medial sliding, the cutout of the screw. The screw is penetrated almost into the joint, the medialization of the distal fragment, the wall is broken, the lateral cortex. And this is another complication again, it is medialized. This is one of my patients actually, and fortunately it went on to healing, uh, some good callus formation, perhaps maybe effect of the teriparatide. I started this patient on teriparatide and eventually she is fine, able to walk comfortably, but unfortunately x-ray is this one. But having said that, even a nail, everything is not rosy rosy. The things can be complicated there as well. So it's that effect, reverse that effect, uh, osteolysis, neck, intracapsular femur fracture, fracture at the tip. Uh, another complication here, complication here. So you can have complication in either side, but you have to decide which implant you are going to use. Why I defend DHS because it's a familiar implant. You got familiar jig, the technique is easy. You got easy availability of the various angle barrel plate, including 125 to 140. Technically quite easy. Open reduction, if possible, can be done through the same incision. And it is reproducible, can be done by any average surgeon. Uh, significant cheaper, of course, that is a big advantage. Perhaps avoiding the shattering in case of associated per trochanter fracture. And it can avoid displacement of fracture in case of basic cervical fracture, whereas nail at any time can go through the fracture and can end up in displacing the fracture. So not a significant difference so far as an operative time or blood loss is concerned. And patient can have start same mobilization yeah, protocol as in PFN, no difference. That's a post of complication if done properly. It has survived over the decade as a gold standard implant, not any change in the design. Whereas PFN can mm -hmm. be short, long, screw, single screw, double screw, helical blade, or any other stuff. So keep changing. So yeah, right. you have to think. So what does literature say? Literature says the DHS will provide excellent fixation for stable trochanter fracture, those having intact lateral wall, and it is less expensive. Of course, it's contraindicated in reverse oblique or where there is a lateral wall broken. Another study, extramedullary versus intramedullary, many prospective randomized comparative trials of intramedullary versus extramedullary fixation of trochanter fracture found significant difference in outcome for unstable fracture but not necessarily for stable fracture. There's another very important study and recent uh, 2019 in JBGS. This is from Bristol, England. Higher 30 days mortality associated with use of intramedial nail compared with sliding hip screws for treatment of trochanter fracture. So point to ponder. Two examples, a 95 years old young lady. I did DHS, she mobilized three months later, perfectly fine, no issues. Uh, another. Another lady, just a hundred years old, protic DHS again, doing very uh, done very well. Another with a interpretation view, DHS again. Another seventy-five years old lady, intertrochan fracture, DHS again, no issues. Another patient, DHS again. Uh, had a DH, uh, nailing on opposite side. I decided for DHS on the opposite, this side. Another example of DHS. Another interesting story, the patient had already DFN and this time intertoken fracture. Obviously, you cannot remove and removal is a big procedure. She's a high-risk patient. So just decided to go at DHS. Of course, you have to 
bypass. You should not be creating a stress fracture. So tip has to be bypassed. And particularly the situation like this, where is the lateral view, unfortunately, X-ray is not very good, but lateral view is completely far off, one kilometer distance, literally. And you can go in through the same approach, just put the two levers and then put a uh, uh, reduction wire and everything is going to be straightforward after that. So after that, this is what the picture is actually. Another three months, uh, this is I think six months down the line, the elderly lady walking comfortably. Another example of this, Another example where there was a pediatric procedure somewhere done. There was intramedullary screws already in place. So obviously ne negotiating nail would have been difficult. Another patient, quite unstable fracture, internal rotation, intraoperatory x-ray. After that, I just put a reduction, uh, derotation reduction wire. And at time, the wire can cross the joint as well. And the second wire is going to be the DHS wire. Another fracture, the check x-ray is here. This is a fracture and then post separative check x-ray. This is another relative. This is not a classical one. Should not be using a DHS here. This was a patient recently operated around six months back. And though intraoperatively, I end up having good picture, but subsequently it has to be like. But fortunately, she's doing perfectly fine. Three months down the line, she's walking comfortably. She's happy and so am I. Another, but not necessarily always I tend to use. I'm not just that way. With the DHS, wherever there's a lateral wall broken, it has to be PFN like this. There's a lateral wall broken, again, the PFS comes into the picture. Lateral wall broken, PFN. So this is subsequent. This is lateral wall broken, PFN again. Extended use of DHS, busy cervical fracture, intercapsular neck of femur fracture, DHS with the derotation, uh, valgus osteotomy, subtrochanter fracture, use of interfragmentis too as well. Use of TSP in case of lateral wall fracture, healed. This is interesting with the previous deformity, gunshot def um, had injury. This time, intercapsular neck of femur fracture, correction intraoperatively, everything with the DHS. Another recently done, uh, five, three months old fracture with valgus osteotomy. However, everything cannot be rosy rosy, technical errors, with slight distraction and that has created some lending as well. Various reduction, medialized. Again, a bit of various reduction. Again, the screw, uh, the the screw were various placed, various reduction, which should be avoided, medialized. This is a rotation. The this the proximal fragment has rotated completely. If you see, it's not matching completely. So take home message: PFN or DHS, either may fail. Do a procedure which you can, you are very, very, very well versed with. Follow the basic principle. Get it right for the first time. First attempt should be the last one. And for stable fracture, DHS is absolutely fine. Even for unstable fracture with a lateral wall intact, DHS, lateral wall broken, PFN. Uh, still gold, gold stranded implant for IT fracture. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Any question? Any question, any comments from the panelists before we wind up today's session? Thank you, Professor Ghani. Can I speak? Yes, please, of course. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, you know, all the topics I really enjoyed and I could uh, spend some time there. And uh, yeah, you're very right on, on the, the last uh, part on your topic is uh, I think uh, uh, as a basic science examiner, one thing we always ask, whatever implant you use, you have to justify it. So whether you use a nail or a plate or something, so justification is very important. You know, you have to understand as a trainee, I think junior trainees, uh, we always expect them to know what they're using. As senior trainees, we ask them why you use that. And that's most important. So it's very well presented. And I think it's uh, very important. I think DHS has its value. People undermine it and they, you know, sort of uh, abuse the implant. But a rightly done surgery is, is, is the way forward for everything. Can I ask uh, Dr. Samath, uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Mittal, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, it's, this is very interesting. I've been asked to talk on, you know, um, 
on pre-op management of uh, neck or femur fractures and it is a big thing you know what is the what's a what's a way we are we are getting a lot of um, elderly population all over europe is very elderly and so is india getting very elderly uh, do you have a names uh, uh, what is called orthogeriatric services for falls assessment because this is such a waste otherwise if you don't falls assess these patients i mean look at such a lovely surgery done by you and within a month the patient comes back bigger surgery falls again all that yeah yes sir thank you sir uh, very nice question so uh, we know this uh, these fractures are not just the fracture of the hip they are in fact a failure of the whole body system whenever one suffers from a hip fracture and keeping that into view in our hospital we have a multidisciplinary approach we have special uh, orthogeriatric ward where we only keep patients above 65 years of age and these wards are simultaneously looked after by both us as well as the geriatricians so a geriatrician uh, not just visits and gives us consult to these beds but they take care of these patients so all the medical management of most of our hip fractures is done by the geriatricians while we as surgeons just go in and we, uh, there are a lot of papers in literature now there is no doubt around the world that the mortality in patients looked after by a combined ortho geriatric team as well as a multidisciplinary approach do much better in fact there is also a very good paper which says that Uh, the results uh, everyone knows that the sooner you operate upon hip fractures the better outcomes they have but then they have de- compared the patients who have got delayed in a setup which has a ortho geriatric backup and the patients which have got delayed beyond the 48 hour window without ortho geriatric backup and they say that if your patient even gets delayed for surgery but they do have a ortho geriatric backup then the patients have much better outcome so there is no doubt that the geriatrician should be involved i think even no matter how good orthopedician we are we need the geriatricians to manage these fractures because this is just certainly not our domain and we follow that to the book uh, at our institute okay uh, dr ghani can i ask dr kalia a question please yeah uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. yeah uh, dr kalia it's a, it's a, it's a absolutely fantastic piece of work you've done there and i just thought why a pie uh, uh, why did you keep this plate as a pie sort of as um, you know instead of having it parallel two things getting parallel like that why didn't you have them cross bar because they would have more resistance to movement if you have a cross bar you get my point yeah yeah Uh, is there any biomechanical? Of- I know you talked about biomechanically. You tested it. Uh, so why did but- you crossbar it? Why did you put? Uh, yeah. the, you know, you can move things less if you crossbar it. Uh, what you're saying is also an acceptable way of doing it. Uh, see, all ideas uh, first need to be tested. A lot of them will be thrown out. Right? For example. initially we thought that our hooks will go through the tendon then we realized that the distance between the hook is so small that the tendon may get lacerated and they have been hook plates also designed initially in which they when they did a biomechanical study on teddy bears they found that it was lacerating the tendon so what i want to say i am just sharing my journey that from an idea to a prototype that is where we have reached in a year Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, we could fructify it and get something out of it now the next stage is uh, still on and uh, since uh, we are testing our implant so thoroughly uh, we should be able to get any flaws that are there in our design and we are really sure put it about it we can change our design any time we want and uh, what we really yeah. want is that we should come up with an implant which should uh, be very cost effective and can be used in a large number of patients that is the whole idea behind it so our right. idea so, yeah. is that in, in case you change uh, in case you change the design to cross bar don't forget to give me the royalty oh sure sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> i am not thinking about royalty any any way along the only thing is that uh, since we already have floated a company what we really want is that uh, uh, we should have some funds with us so that there may be 100 ideas and let us try all of them I think that is where India is lacking is, is innovation. We are using implant designed by AO. We are using implant designed by Arthrex. But which is the implant that we have really developed ourselves? So I think uh, it is it is it is a time of the need of the hour rather that uh, we should have a company which should take okay fine. You bring our idea to us, actually we test it properly. If it fails, it's fine. But then we will find something that will really work. So we have different kind of patients with us. We have different kind of. That's physiology with us. We have different kind of anatomy with us. 
and the good thing would be that it is just a start so let's see where journey takes us great thank you thank you um, just a simple comment for siddharth is siddharth online and yes. siddharth you you never stop amazing me with your knowledge and uh, the good work that you're doing in that institution really very nice excellent you know i always i always tell uh, but i could not uh, so that the cross screws does that create problems or do you put them parallel with two approaches but two uh, screws should be parallel so so they should be perpendicular to the fracture line we are not really trying mm. to have a cross screw configuration it depends on what the fracture line is okay okay all right uh and sir i had a follow up comment to your uh, thing about falls assessment yeah yeah so we are we are doing a longitudinal study uh, which is a community based study on elders who you know in chandigarh who have no cognitive impairment because yeah. we know that people with neurological disorders parkinsons etc you know they are at high risk of falls but in our own longitudinal study we have seen that people who have fear of falling who have had a fall in the preceding 6 months who do not have any fall prevention aids back at home so mind you these are anti slip mats and you know holding on bars and all those things mm. and a turn around test so in our study we have found that these were significant predictors of a subsequent fall so we will be publishing this data very soon and we are you know in the process of developing a clinical risk prediction score or something mm. like an artificial neural network that we can put in the back end of an app to predict the falls in our own population but this is only yeah. for community dwelling elders who do not have cognitive impairment so we hope yeah. that this will be of help to you know people here brilliant very good thank you dr ghani hopefully you will have you won't have this virtual thing next year and we will all meet together and have a good dinner well 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 i am trying to experiment to save money <laughs> what we done is <laughs> what we have done this time is we got offline as well as online we got faculty okay. online we do have uh, people gathered in the hotel so we will okay. going to have a uh, part of it as a conference the other part as well so unfortunately you people won't be able to join us so anyways hopefully soon yeah. i wish the corona is going to go and uh, then we'll be joining together good so anyways thank you very much all the speakers thank you artho tv uh, it was wonderful and uh, i see, will see you tomorrow again actually at 6 o'clock thank you once again and uh, uh, can i show can i just twist around and show the audience to you as yes that will be very nice and uh, a big uh, um, hello to everybody i think we can see only the ceiling at the moment yes uh, brilliant yeah. very good excellent and dr ghani i must say uh, the, you know the uh, the earlier speaker he was excellent in what conditions you guys are working there and what great results you're doing uh, i think dr it was uh, uh, rad was it khalid muzaffar dr khalid muzaffar and then muzaffar. yeah and uh, uh who you know they are really difficult cases fantastic absolutely the results we are seeing yeah and you know what dr sain was saying is a interesting thing and i think i we talk about this india sits on a huge amount of data if you can just keep your data and you can produce so nice papers you know so what we see once in six months is to once every day that's how it happens because the population is so huge you know whether it's tumors whether it is other things whether it's deformities whether it is you know conditions of bone which we we would see one and we would have to tell all the trainees all over in ireland see this is a case we saw that's the way it is good thank you i i really won't uh, take any more time i feel any time thank you thank you
Thanks a lot. Thank you.